the blood system. We're ready to continue. And uh, next up, we have uh, a topic, I guess, which has been of a bit of a hot topic in the sense that a lot of people are scratching their heads around it. Um, and that is, of course, the topic of taxation, especially when it comes to the taxation of cryptocurrencies. How are they dealt with? Under which regime should they fall under? What about anything that falls under one jurisdiction but not the other? So how is all this treated? And for that, I'd like to welcome on stage Ms. Antoine Cherry from NextABT, who will be explaining about the tax framework here in Malta and how crypto assets are dealt under the local framework. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, as Jonathan said, a very, very hot topic. However, I'm proud to say that Malta has in terms of the tax side, as well as other regu regulatory, from the regulatory side, has given some certainty and clarity to those wishing to set up in Malta um, in relation to this evolving industry. So, um, uh, what I must say to start with is that there is no specific regulations in the Maltese tax um, regulations or in Maltese tax law specifically targeted um, around the taxation of cryptocurrencies and income or gains derived um, from cryptocurrencies. However, what we do is that we take the general concepts, the basis of taxation in the Income Tax Act, um, general regulations and principles um, to determine taxability or otherwise of a particular transaction involving cryptocurrencies in Malta. The clarity which I've mentioned as I started my, my speech is that in uh, November of last year, the Maltese tax authorities have even issued guidelines, three set of guidelines actually, which have provided more um, comfort in relation of how to assess a transaction involving um, uh, DLT assets. Um, these, the three set of guidelines were actually issued. One is an income tax guideline which provides the a guideline to practitioners and also uh, players in the industry on income tax. Another guideline is in relation to value-added tax. And another set of guidelines in relation to stamp duty, more relevant in the context of tokens. So I'm going to, in the, in the next 20 minutes, what I will be doing is I will be going through how to analyze a transaction with Maltese tax legislation when it comes to taxation. As with any other transaction, not just cryptos, one has to first establish the status of the taxpayer. Whether the taxpayer is a person who is, or a company, resident or domiciled in Malta. So the first step to undertake is to determine the status of the company or the individual realizing an income or gain from cryptos. The general um, rules for any other income would follow. That is, that if a person is resident and domiciled in Malta, like I am, I was born in Malta, I obtained domicile, I live in Malta, I am resident, so I am taxable on a worldwide basis. So I am taxable on all my income and capital gains arising, arising not just in Malta, but anywhere in the world, because I am resident and domiciled in Malta. However, Maltese tax law also embraces the concept of those who are resident but not domiciled in Malta. So people who just moved to Malta, moved to Malta, they are living in Malta, but they have not obtained domicile. Domicile is a strict concept. It's not that easy to obtain. And these types of people are taxable in Malta only on Malta source income and foreign income, which is received remitted to Malta. Capital gains which arise outside of Malta, even if they are um, remitted or received in Malta, they still remain outside the Maltese tax net. Then there is the concept on, of non-resident persons who are taxable in Malta only on income which is deemed arising in Malta, such as income from sale or rental of a movable property that would follow the lexitus where the property is situated, so that's taxable only in Malta. So that's the state of the, of, the, of the taxpayer, which starts to give us an idea on whether in the first place the company or the individual is subject to tax in Malta, whether Malta has the right to tax that income of the company or individual. 
The second crucial determination is in the case of a, D in a DLT context, we're talking about cryptos here, is the classification of the gain, whether it's income or capital. This is a very crucial determination. Why? Because not all capital gains in Malta are subject to tax. There is a list of capital gains, which if the capital gain is in relation to that asset, the, it is subject to taxation. If not, the capital gain would be outside the scope of Maltese tax. So the crucial, I must say, very crucial determination, determination, even when it comes to cryptos, is whether the person realizing income is actually realizing a trading income or a capital gain. The distinction is very important, as I said previously, and it is sometimes a difficulty which arises how to determine actually if the, the gain is a capital gain or if it, it is in the course of trade. And in order to establish these, and these are also mentioned specifically in the guidelines issued by the tax authorities, is that we use the badges of trade. These were developed in 1955, and we commonly, very commonly use the badges of trade to determine whether the person is trading or the gain is of a capital nature. There are actually about nine badges of trade, but not by just satisfying one badge of trade, you can say that the income is of a trading nature or not. What are the badges of trade? Badges of trade that we usually do, do and which are most relevant in this context are the frequency of trade. So is this person, this company, just have purchased some cryptocurrency and sold them and stopped there? Or there's, there's frequency, purchase and sale, purchase and sale. That would point more towards a trading activity. However, the frequency on its own is not just enough. There are other um, badges of trade, like for example, the volume of transactions, which is linked to the frequency. If the, 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 the person or the company purchased a huge amount of cryptocurrency, that might also point towards a trade, even more so if there's frequency of trading. The profit-seeking motive, the nature of the asset, changes to the asset, which, which in this regard, changes to the asset is not that 100% relevant to cryptos. The existence of similar trade. Is the company, the individual, in his own ordinary course of business doing trading in securities, in cryptos, in fiat currency? Because that also might point towards a trade. So these are all um, uh, concepts we use to determine that crucial determination between income versus capital. The method of acquisition is another factor which we also look at. So if the person inherited or was donated the asset in question, it is unlikely that the, the income therefrom is in the course of trade. But not every situation, every situation is different. So not just one badge of trade gives us the determination. It is the package as a whole, the individual, the company as a whole that determines capital versus income. The list, so if we determine that the income is of an income of a trading nature, there's the rules of taxable income in the case of, of trading income, which I will go through in the next slides. If the gain is determined to be a capital gain, it might not be subject to taxation in some cases because Article 5 of the Income Tax Act lists assets which are treated as taxable if a capital gain is realized. And these assets are immovable property, securities, intellectual properties, and beneficial interest in a trust or in a partnership. This is the list of the assets. Um, it's not an exhaustive, but the most common ones that is subject to tax if a capital gain arises. So we have so far spoke about three crucial determinations. That is the status of the taxpayer, residence, domicile, boat, one of each, um, either or is missing. We have to classify the asset, as I must say in the next slides, and also um, the classification, whether it's a capital gain or an, inc or an income in the course of trade. The guidelines then, um, I'm talking of the guidelines because we base our tax um, determination on these guidelines, have split the DLT asset into three different categories, being coins, financial tokens, and utility tokens. 
So the guidelines split the DLT assets into three, and each one of them have to be analyzed in detail to determine whether if a gain or at an income is realized, it is taxable or not. So speaking about coins, the guidelines determine that in order for a DLT asset to be treated as a coin, it must be used as a means of payment. Bitcoin, Ethereum, cryptocurrencies are um, uh, most often seen by the tax authorities as being um, uh, coins, as being a means of payment. So we have to follow the tax rules similar to a fiat currency because a coin which have no other characteristic than being a means of payment does not have the characteristic, characteristic of a security because that would then tend to take the tax implications of a security. A coin is treated just like a fiat currency. So um, uh, what other characteristics we look at when analyzing coins, taxation of um, uh, coins, is that the coin, another characteristic is that it does not have any connection with any other project. Reason being that then we would have to follow the tax implications relevant to um, uh, tokens, to security tokens. Um, or utility, rather utility tokens, if the coin have any characteristic with any, any connection with any project. It's not related to any redemption of good, so it's just a means of payment. It, it cannot be redeemed for a good or a service, because that then would take also the characteristic of a utility token. Specifically, the guidelines refer to coins as cryptocurrencies. In this case, what is, once we determined that we are talking about a coin, a means of payment, what are the tax implications? The tax treatment is identical to that of fiat currency, and one has to determine whether coins are held for trading or are tax, um, a capital gain. So if I'm trading in cryptocurrency currencies and I realize a gain, that gain is trading income in the course of business, being a company or an individual, the system works the same, and that income from coins is taxable. If the gain is, however, of a capital nature, we determine using the badges of trade that the gain is not in the course of trade, then that's a capital gain which is not listed in one of the assets um, taxable as a capital gain, and that would fall outside the scope of Maltese taxation. With respect to mining of cryptocurrency, in the guidelines, the authorities specifically mentioned that gains or profits on revenue account from mining should be treated as income and therefore subject to taxation. These are guidelines, um, so we usually take a case on its own, and whenever the good thing about Malta is that it's a small country, the revenue are also approachable, so if there is any clarification required, we would um, approach the authorities on any particular, for example, coin or token um, to get more clarity. So with respect to coins, if it's of an income nature, it's taxable. If it is a capital gain, it's not taxable because it's not one of the capital assets. I don't know if there are any questions specifically related to coins before I move on to financial tokens. The good thing, one last point in relation to coins, is that the Maltese tax system is a self-assessment system. So basically, it is the taxpayer, the company, or the individual who fills up their own income tax return, decides what income is taxable and what is not, and submit, submits it to the Maltese tax authorities every year. Then it is up to the tax authorities who have the right to ask for further information. So it is always advisable to keep record of everything to, to sort of have um, uh, the conclusion why it's income, why it's capital, why it's taxable, why it's not. But being a self-assessment system, it's the taxpayer, sometimes um, uh, with the help of a tax advisor, to determine all these um, determinations on whether the income is taxable or not. The second classification in the guidelines is financial tokens. So um, uh, it's uh, the characteristic which, for tax purposes, classify a DLT asset as a, a, secure, a, a financial token is that the token will be similar to equity, have the characteristics of a security. And the income realized usually from a security, so the token must give the right to dividend, must give the right to income, which is similar to income, which is usually connected with shares 
or security, or to interest like bonds, payment from unit, units in a collective investment scheme, payments linked with the performance of a specific asset like a derivative. Another characteristic to classify a DLT asset as a financial token is that it grants rewards based on performance of the company, like voting rights, represent ownership in assets, all these point to where, towards the asset being classified as a financial token, and then we have to go to what the law says in relation to financial instruments, to securities. What does the law say in respect to income or gains in relation um, to security? Income from financial tokens is usually taxable according to the nature of the income. That is whether it is similar to a dividend, interest, or other returns. A good thing to mention at this point is with respect to dividend income, Malta embraces the concept of the full imputation system, whereby if a company pays, when the company pays the tax, dividends flowing upwards to the shareholder is not further taxed in Malta because the tax paid at company level is imputed in full at the level of the shareholder. So if the income generated from the financial token is a dividend, the taxpayer would register in Malta, declare that dividend. There's also some options not to even declare if that results in no further taxation. So that's the income resulting from the token. Then there is income, the gain, if the token is disposed, it's transferred or sold. In this regard, um, income from the sale of financial token is taxable as trading income if the taxpayer trades in financial tokens. So if the taxpayer is trading, then that's taxable. Any gain is taxable. The imp another important consideration, then what if it is a capital gain arising in relation to a sale of a token? It's not trading, it's a capital gain from the sale of a financial token. In this respect, um, it will still be subject to capital gains tax in Malta only if a criteria is met, that, it, uh, that is only if the financial token is, meets the definition of a security in terms of Article 5 of the Income Tax Act. And the security is defined, so it is easy to make such classification because a security is defined in Maltese tax law. It is defined as uh, particularly if they participate in any way in the profits of the company and their return is not limited to a fixed rate of return. Or if there are units in a collective invest investment scheme or units and such like instruments relating to long linked long term business of insurance. So what we have to decide is whether it's again trading income or a capital gain. If it's trading income, it's taxable. If it is a capital gain, a step further. Is the capital, is the, the financial token, does it meet the definition of a security? If it does, then the capital gain is subject to taxation in Malta. So basically, the guidelines give clarity in that they give clarity also on how to determine whether it's income or capital, how to classify the asset, and how to tax the asset accordingly. I don't know if there are any other quest any questions in relation to financial tokens before I move to the last point in relation to uh, sec um, uh, utility tokens. Okay, I assume that everything is, is clear. <laughs> The, another classification, the, the last classification, is utility tokens mentioned in the guidelines. And how are utility tokens characterized to be able to take the treatment, the tax treatment applicable to utility tokens? Utility tokens, the application, the, the application of such tax treatment is restricted to the acquisition of goods or services services so the token is linked to the acquisition of a good or a service issued either issued or within the DLT platform in relation to which they are issued or limited network of DLT platform so what is a utility token it is a token which gives the investor the holder the right to acquire goods or services in the future from that company that is as simple a, a utility classified as a utility token the law speaks also, and this is an important point to make, about hybrid tokens, that is those tokens which have the characteristics of both a utility and a financial token. In that case, we have to see at that point in time, it follows more to be a security or a utility token and take the tax treatment. 
What is the tax treatment of utility tokens? Utility tokens are uh, not expected to generate any income to the holder. So once the holder of a utility token has that token, it doesn't generate any income per se. But the holder can actually sell that token. So utility tokens, even in terms of the guidelines of, um, issued by the tax authorities, do not in themselves generate any revenue. However, the holder can go on an exchange and trade the token, can sell the token itself. The sale of utility tokens is taxable in Malta if the seller trades in tokens. Again, if it is in the ordinary course of trade. So if it is in the course of trade, then it's classified as trading income and it's taxable. If the gain, however, from the utility token is of a capital nature, the gain should not be taxable. Reason is that utility tokens are, one, are not one of the listed assets under Article 5, which, if sold, are taxable as a capital gain. So the law splits the DLT asset into three, which we have seen, coins, financial tokens, and utility tokens, and the tax treatment is rather simple, I must say. So three crucial determinations, income versus trade, what is the asset, what is the status of the taxpayer, a resident, a domiciled of Malta, to arrive at the tax treatment. Sometimes the, the question is that what if I, but, but will I, am I conducting a trade? That is the, the most difficult um, question to answer. There's no one hard rule of trading versus income. There's case law which we refer to to determine um, this determination. The, the guidelines to the tax authority of the tax authorities also go into the value. So if my company is generating revenue and this revenue is in cryptocurrency, what should I do? Obviously, in Malta, the functional currency of a company should be, it can not be the euro, but the company should report in euro. So taxation and VAT have to be filled in in euro, and there's a conversion process. The guidelines also speak about such conversion process, but it is important, and apart from value, the guidelines also speak of records, to keep proper records on how values are arrived at. So there are obviously fines if records are not, are not kept properly, especially with respect um, to, to conversions, how to record the payments, um, et cetera. Revenue earned in, in a cryptocurrency is treated like revenue earned in any, fiat, in any other fiat currency. So there is no different treatment if the revenue is, account is received in, in a cryptocurrency or not. The, the tax treatment is the same. And it takes me back from where I've started. Malta has not issued any specific tax, tax, tax regulation in relation to cryptos. We're using what we have, the tax legislation that, that was already in place with some guidelines to determine the applicable tax treatment. Um, uh, I think that's all I had um, prepared so for my 20 minute session. I do not know if there are any, any questions in this regard. Yes? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, if I make a work uh, and I, pay, I am paid with a security token, I will not have to pay tax? Is that so, it? if you're working in Malta, yeah. so we determine that you're taxable in Malta because you're presumably resident. And your income, instead of paying you, your, your employer, instead of paying you in euros, he pays you in a token. No, that's not exempt because that transaction is not a transaction in relation to tokens. It is employment income. So we have to follow the rules for employment income. So instead of earning 1,500 euros a month, your salary is 10 tokens in a particular um, uh, entity. We have to value that token because that transaction has to be separate and taxation of employment income. Then you will be the holder of the tokens. And then you have to determine whether if you sell those tokens, that's taxable or not. If they are a security, a financial token, when you sell that token, that is taxable. And you, then you have to see your cost of acquisition of that token, which would be what has already been taxed in your employment income. So to, to, to answer your question, that's taxation of employment income, not taxation of the token. 
So your first determination is the taxation of the employment income, which is taxable. Employment income is of, of a multi source if carried out in Malta, so that's taxable, even if earned in a cryptocurrency or a token. I, I get your point, but uh, in which case, uh, so you say that you, you have to see uh, the underlying transition, the, 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 the root transition, the, the event, so it's an employee, okay, transaction. So uh, in which case, uh, uh, utility token um, is not uh, taxable? Because in each case, when you receive a security token, uh, utility token, sorry, it's for, you know, a value, it's a value. It's yes. a reward for value, yeah. If you receive the token in return for employment income, that's taxable as the employment income is taxable. So I've worked, I've earned employment, I've earned tokens instead of euros. So that's a taxable point. Employment income exercised in Malta. After that, I'm the holder of the tokens. And then I would follow the tax treatment of the tokens. There are two taxable events then, the employment income and the tokens. Well, I'll, I'll be in our stand at the blockchain advisory stand. It's downstairs. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have because the next speaker is coming up. I'll be outside just for 10 minutes after the session and then downstairs in our stand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoinette, for some great crypto uh, taxation insights. I suggest if you have any questions, Antoinette will be here. Uh, you can ask her or uh, she'll be at the stand uh, number uh, stand G plus one. Um, so you can talk to her about uh, any question you have. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Georgi. Uh, he's gonna talk about uh, the use of smart tokens uh, in securities field. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. So we had uh, quite few lawyers today, and uh, I'm myself a lawyer as well. My background is um, I worked for five years in Deloitte in uh, financial services industry. I was a manager there in uh, tax and legal group. And um, in 2016, we started um, to work with blockchain projects uh, when ICOs were booming and when these were becoming mainstream. And uh, what fascinated me in this is how DOT technology can um, change the securities markets and the way how the security markets operate and works and how it can actually become a new world. So last year I moved to a company called uh, Tekinomica. Guys, I think yeah, we have a problem with. So yeah, I will, I will just, while we're waiting for the slides. So our company is based here in Malta. Uh, we are a regulated, we will be a regulated uh, VFA exchange one, uh, once uh, the, uh, the local regulator starts uh, giving the license. We're currently operating under the transitional period and uh, we are building here a financial ecosystem which uh, will be based on creating a ecosystem for securities, token issuing and trading. So, no, no slides, all right. <laughs> yeah. So we can wait or we can proceed. Tell me. All right, let's. All right, so let's let's just go forward and I will catch up once the slides are back. Um, so yeah, uh, the ecosystem that we are building will be uh, will have three main components. The first one and is like the main one is a platform to issue security tokens. Uh, we already launched a beta version. Uh, we have uh, 
couple of options available. Uh, basically, the main uh, point of the platform is uh, to be a um, unified place where projects can um, can create uh, legally compliant security tokens. So we are um, we are working with or on the basis of uh, Waves blockchain to create the security tokens, and we also connect uh, different uh, legal service providers to the platform in order to uh, allow projects to have everything every documentation required to make a fully legal compliant issue. So the way it works is that the projects come to us, uh, select a financial instrument that they want to issue, and for that we help them as well. So they input basic information on what they want to achieve, and, they re and we recommend them the type of financial instrument and the jurisdiction where they want to issue, where they want to issue the token. Then we connect them with the legal providers and everybody else who is required to the token issuing, who are directly connected to the platform as well. And once everything uh, is done in terms of documentation, the project can issue the, uh, the security token on the blockchain through the platform as well. Uh, the second main element is the secondary trading platform. And this is more based uh, in uh, having in mind the, the investors in security tokens. So once the, the token is, is, is issued, it will be traded on our secondary trading platform. And the third element uh, is the one that I mentioned already, is uh, the VFA exchange, which is already launched here in Malta and available for trading, which is uh, serving us to have um, crypto liquidity to the security markets. So today, I'm actually gonna be speaking more about technology than anything else. We had a um, couple of interesting thoughts during the uh, workshop today. Uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, in the beginning the um, uh, increasingly developing uh, decentralized trading. Uh, Adam also mentioned that the uh, decentralized trading is, is, is quite interesting, but it is lacking maturity because we need uh, somehow to um, achieve compliance with IML KYC regulations, uh, with uh, security regulations, and so on. And uh, actually that's where our main focus is. So what we're trying to achieve is to give additional value to tokens uh, in form of uh, building um, a uh, digital scripts that will allow to, to comply with different regulations. And this technology is called uh, Smart Assets. It is built on uh, Waves blockchain on the proprietary uh, language called Write for dApps. Uh, so basically smart tokens are smart assets, uh, which means that they are unique tokens that contain uh, a unique set of rules which is provided in the script of the asset. So I will just <laughs> explain on the examples. Let's take our VFA exchange that I mentioned. Um, as you know, here in Malta, there is a uh, quite um, extensive regulation about what VFA exchanges uh, need to comply with. And uh, we actually built our platform as a decentralized exchange. So that makes uh, uh, it a bit more complicated to comply because we don't have a real centralized control over the client's asset. But um, those smart assets allow us to comply with the regulations in a way, in an effective way. So for instance, uh, Jonathan mentioned on the, at the beginning that only um, assets that are qualified are as virtual, virtual financial assets can be traded on VFAs. So uh, that means that we can actually create a script in the token and build in this script the pairs that this token can be traded with. So for instance, if we want to allow this token to be traded only against utility tokens, because regulator prohibits other ways, we can do so. So we classify the, the token as a utility through the legal opinions and the compliance stuff, and we add this uh, specific token for to be tradable versus Bitcoin on our exchange. Meaning that if a client wants to make a trade with any other non-compliant token, he will not be allowed to do so, not by any centralized party, but by the script of the asset itself. And uh, the same happens with the users. So again, decentralized exchange is where users trade directly, uh, trade directly with each other. So there's no centralized counterparty that provide uh, trades to the, to, the, to the users. But as Jonathan as well mentioned, uh, there is a need to be sure that those users are compliant, so that they are not in the section lists, that they are uh, known, uh, they passed KYC checks by uh, authorized provider, and so on. So 
what Smart Assets allows us is to create a wi whitelist, uh, a whitelist which is a um, database stored on blockchain, to which certain service providers, let's say IML KYC providers, can add addresses of uh, the wallets of the users that have passed the KYC checks. So once the smart assets, once a user wants to s send a smart asset to another user, there is a two-step process. There is a check against this whitelist in the blockchain to find the address. Once the address is found, the asset can be transferred. But if the address is not included because the other user haven't passed the KYC check, the trade will not happen. So again, that allows us to still bring the decentralized trading, but add this compliance element to the, to the asset itself. So the asset script is the one checking the, the rules, the compliance with the rules. And uh, the second part, which is also uh, a part of technology of smart tokens, is a smart account. So smart account, uh, it's a classic uh, crypto wallet, uh, but it can be limited, again, by a script and uh, limited in certain ways that, for example, it could require a multi-signature for some operations. For example, uh, any amount which exceeds certain, certain, certain amount in cash can, can require a multi-signature from IML provider to make sure that like, this, this, because of this amount is subject to source of uh, funds uh, approval they will first check it and then s sign the sign the transfer and then this this will happen so this allows us to actually comply with those um, regulations that require for any reason to make additional checks before any amount is withdrawn deposited or transferred and this again is included in the smart account of a user which is created on on, on, on our exchange so I, I just added uh, practical um, examples, but what we are talking today, or we are going to be talking today, is how this smart technology can be used in, in securities field. So uh, there is a recent uh, like hype around STOs. We, we talked about them today as well. And uh, we, see a lot of, um, we see a lot of media and, and, and other, other guys in crypto, in crypto world uh, stating some benefits of, of security tokens uh, and normally saying that it will reduce the listing fees, it will add a new layer of, of liquidity in form of cryptocurrencies to the security markets, it also will reduce the time of transaction and uh, will reduce the number of intermediaries and so on and so forth. Which we agree with, but uh, our view is that actually tokens can improve the way how the securities market works right now. And this is done because of these technical features that I mentioned. So in our view, uh, security tokens can provide customization, compliance, and automatization to security market. So by customization, I mean that you can create a security which can have at the same time different uh, characteristics which are not present in the current security world. So for instance, let's say you want to um, to give the investors periodical fixed payments each, each quarter, for example. But at the same time, which is a characteristic of a bond. But at the same time, you want to give uh, the investor the ability to vote on certain issues. So this is some sort of hybrid between a share and a bond, which is not really, which does not really exist right now in the securities, in the securities field. But you can do so by creating a, a token which will have a, the fixed periodical payments, but again, which also will have the possibility to, to participate in voting. Then the compliance part. The compliance part I mentioned already. Uh, so for instance, um, um, basically there are certain cases where, for example, the issuers can only sell tokens to qualified investors. You, they cannot sell it to retail investors. And this is achieved right now by uh, actually compliance teams or compliance checks by the issuer part or some sort of uh, intermediaries that work, work with issuers. Or for example, cases where a share can be only be sold to another shareholder, so so-called preemption rights. Um, so these limitations can be, as, as I mentioned before for, for VFA uh, example, can be as well in, um, included in the smart asset. So for example, you can make a white list of sh current shareholders and make the token transferable only um, amongst those. 
you can create a whitelist of qualified um, investors and can on and limit the, uh, the token and the script to be transferred only amongst those. So this is something that significantly uh, facilitates the process of, of compliance. And by automatization, uh, we mean that a lot of um, a lot of actions that exist in the in the security skill, such as car protections, payments, redemptions, and so on, can as well be automized. Uh, autom can be automatically done on, on uh, with with the, with this with this technology. So uh, by having digital wallets on 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 blockchain, the issuer always knows who are the holders of of the of the security tokens. This is not the case in the securities world because normally once the shares are issued there are millions of uh, of holders and those are known by, by the intermediaries who are acting as uh, payment agents but not the, by the issuer himself so he just makes one payment and then this payment is distributed amongst different shareholders with the use of intermediaries but here we have a huge database which is at any time um, available for the issuers and every every distribution can be made um, using the DLT technology as well. So, yeah, and maybe maybe last case that I, I wanted to mention is the convertible uh, convertible security. So there is, um, uh, there are financial instruments that uh, are issued, for example, you can issue a bond and say that if a certain condition is met, for example, once a certain period is passed, this bond will be converted into a share in a company. And there is uh, like two, at least two different processes. You first issue the bond and then you have to convert. And it also is accomplished with uh, service providers, intermediaries, and, and time lapse. Here you can actually uh, include those conditions into the script and say that, for example, during the first two years, the token will be paying fixed amount of um, of interest payment, which are normally used in bonds, and once this period is done, the token will like stop doing so and will provide you uh, the right to receive uh, dividends from the company and the right to vote in the company, and that will be done automatically using the smart uh, smart asset technology. So, yeah, I think uh, that's more or less it. So if you have any questions, yes? Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. So the language that I mentioned, the right language uh, on waste blockchain is specifically uh, created um, to build these smart assets and smart accounts um, let's say smart tokens. So it is very customizable. So for us, uh, we, we need to make sure that everything that is needed for compliance reasons and everything that is needed for the issuers to make sure that investors will come can be customizable at the level of the script. Uh, and Waves technology provides us this, this possibility. We are also looking at Ethereum, and, uh, but with Ethereum, it's more on the level of the developers of smart contracts where yes, there are developers who can achieve that level of customization, but is not, it is not mass, uh, mass adoption. Because uh, here, we, we actually can create a couple of templates. We can give them to a project, and they can like you know select the, the data and issue a token on and what is the blockchain. So it's, it's easier. And as well, uh, in terms of costs, uh, there is no gas on waste blockchain, and the transaction fees are very low, as well as uh, the fees to create a smart, a smart, smart asset. So, uh, when we are talking that like security tokens will be um, more convenient for for the investors because it will cost less to transact with them, the listing fees will reduce. We need to make sure that the technology also allows us to do so because if we're going to pay a lot of uh, commission to nots, we, will, we won't we won't be achieving that. But uh, we, uh, just just to make sure we are not limiting to waves. It's just right now we are looking at solutions that can can provide us this you know. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, sir. Thank you, Georgie. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joshua Elul. 
uh, chairman of Malta Digital Innovation Authority. Okay, um, so just to introduce myself, um, I'm, yes, the chairman of the Malta Digital Innovation Authority, um, but I'm also the director at the Center for Distributed Ledger Technologies at the University of Malta. So I, I wear these two hats. One hat where we're really looking at innovation, of uh, furthering uh, the, the academic field, and the other hat where we're looking at how do we provide regulation on this innovation without hindering the innovation. Um, so when we're talking about um, blockchain technology. We're actually talking about really software. And we've been developing software for a very long time. We've been developing software since 60s, 50s, right? Where here's an early operating system, DOS. Uh, we've had huge advancements in time. Now we have excellent GUIs. We have browsers where you can use loads of services just by logging onto your, your web browser. Mobile phones, the Internet of Things, the next revolution perhaps where computational devices will be embedded into the environment robots using artificial intelligence to provide some useful uh, services for the users. And also, if you look about a decade ago or, or, or perhaps a bit more, we also had peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems. And really and truly, when you think about blockchain, blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer system where every node is equal in the system. So we have experience developing this software, right? And software just works. We've gotten really good at writing software. We write our software, we release it, and it works. No problems, right? Well, wrong. Um, I'm sure you've all seen at some point or other uh, the blue screen of death. It's happening less and less over time. Or the beach ball spinning on your Mac system. Or even web browsers crashing, which could be due to the web browser bugs or even due to HTML code, which causes, or JavaScript code, which causes this code to crash. Mobile phones bricking or even robotics themselves crashing due to some bug in the software. Um, but it's not just about software. Often logic, often computational intelligence is embedded into hardware and firmware. Even hardware is very limited in terms of the types of programming that we can do on these systems. So when we're looking at hardware implementation nowadays, we write this hardware as software. We're no longer working at circuit level, we're now working at software which defines the circuitry. And one particular thing to notice about these types of hardware systems, you cannot update hardware. Once it's deployed, it's deployed there for good. You could choose to, to uh, plug out some components and put them back in, but that's gonna be very costly. Firmware, which we can upload onto hardware, which is software we upload onto the devices, can be updated. However, it's very often inaccessible. And um, if we think about hardware, we can even have bugs in hardware. And we've seen many types of bugs in hardware that cause huge financial losses. There was the Pentium FDiv bug, which was re released in Pentium's the processors, which actually resulted in Pentium calling back all of the processors that had this particular bug. Um, so besides this, we also have systems that are critical systems that are, are extremely important that the system operates without failure, no matter what. And what are these critical systems? These are systems that if there's any bug, it could result in loss of data. It could result in leaking of sensitive data. It could, if a bug happens in these types of systems, it could jeopardize the whole operation to do with where we're using this particular system for. It could result in large financial losses. Or even in the very worst case, critical systems could even result in loss of life or material damage. And just to mention a few infamous bugs, there was the NASA Spirit Rover, which after being deployed after a few weeks, it became unresponsive. And this happened because they were storing more files on the system and eventually they ran out of file space. The Therac 25 radiation therapy uh, machine, which actually ended up giving to its patients an overdose of radiation therapy, resulting in at least five deaths. The Y2K bug, which we all remember. 
Um, similarly, we're going to have a very similar bug in year 2038. It all has to do with how we store dates on the machine. And we're going to come to this bug again in year 2038, and then again in year 2106, a similar version of the bug. And if you look at Bitcoin, how Bitcoin actually stores its formats, it stores it using this particular format, which in year 2106, if we don't upgrade the Bitcoin software, we will suffer this problem. But we have a lot of time to fix that. And so on and so forth. There's, there's many other bugs. So now that we've been de developing software for decades, how do we go about assuring that these bugs are not there before we deploy the software? So we have developer support tools, which provide feedback to the developers programming as they're programming how they can remove the bugs from their system. We have testing regimes where the, the developer himself will write the code and then he will, he will test the code to assure that it's actually doing what he wants it to do. We also have independent testing frameworks where we have independent people looking at the code because when you're a developer writing code, you're going to get a very biased look at the code and you might not see certain edge cases that others would see. However, testing is only as good as the coverage. The, the, the result that is produced from your actual implementation, you can only guarantee what you've actually tested. If you haven't tested some other operations, you have no guarantees that it'll do what it was supposed to do. And to make matters worse, there are even types of bugs, which we call Heisen bugs, which are bugs that we, when you try to find them, when you try to look at them, they just freeze and they act like they're, they're not there. So they're at bugs that only uh, act as bugs when you're not interrogating the system. And th there's this comic which tries to depict that. So um, the computer works fine when you're looking at it, but not when you look away. And these bugs exist because of the types of systems that we write, which are often involve different processes running at the same time. And so what else ca can we do? We can have implementations of static verification. So what static verification is, it's a process where you define a specification. You define what you expect the program to do, not how it's implemented. And then we have these tools that will match what you expect it to do with how it's implemented. It will test to see if it's actually doing what you expect it to do. And we have these tools that, yes, report back. The program is doing what you expect it to do. Brilliant. However, static verification suffers from the fact that it takes a very long time to prove these specifications. And there's some work out there called runtime verification, which tries to fill in this gap. Where we cannot solve the specification prover at compile time before we deploy the code, we can, we can perform runtime verification as the code is running to assure that yes, the program is still doing what we expect it to do. As soon as it stops, you can say, stop the program. It seems like you're going to send money to an account that is going to be locked forever. Stop, whatever the, the, the property is. However, both these techniques, the ver verification techniques, suffer from the same problem. The, the test, the, the actual assurances provided are only as good as the verification specification fed into the program. And when all else fails, we have code fixes. We find a bug, so we deploy a system, we find a bug in the system, the programmer investigates what the bug is, writes some code updates, deploys it, and it's fixed. Brilliant. Is this good enough? Yes, for many applications, it is good enough. For web-based enterprise applications, it's often good enough. However, when we're talking about safety critical applications where lives are on the line, huge financial losses are on the line, uh, material damage is on the line, then no, this is not good enough. And also where systems require that the code is uploaded once and only once, you cannot deploy an update. So for these sort of scenarios, what we have till today, it's not good enough, unfortunately. Now enter smart contracts, the blockchain world and the provision of decentralized computation of smart contracts, which bring along with them user assurances. We can now allow for the decentralized computational execution of logic which guarantees to the users that the smart contract is doing what they signed up to do. They can look at the code and say, I agree to this, and it, the, the system, the blockchain system is definitely going to execute what they signed up to. However, it's very important to note that code that is executed on a blockchain is immutable. The code uploaded can never be changed. So it has a, a very similar property to the hardware-based systems that we've been looking at. Also, um, the advantage to, it, well now this is an advantage, uh, it, it being immutable as well. So when you sign up to a contract, you know that they can never change that code, they can never change that contract under, uh, with, without you knowing. So it, it's definitely guaranteed to do what you signed up to do. And as well, parties know what they're agreeing to because the code is available for all to see. So 
one, posi one positive thing of such smart contracts is they're often simple, right? So simpler code should mean they're easier to test, easier to prove that they're going to do what we expect them to do. Now here, this is a very simple um, uh, snippet of solidity code. And, all, and I'm actually going to explain it. Um, so this line over here is increasing the user's balance by an amount sent in. So this code over here allows for a user to send into the smart contract an amount of, uh, let's say money, cryptocurrency, whatever, in this particular case it's Ethereum. So I can send in an amount of Ethereum, Ether, into this contract, let's say 100 Ether, and then in future this contract should only allow me, as the depositor, to withdraw my 100 Ether. Someone else could also put in their 50 Ether into the contract, but it should make sure that only they can withdraw that, that Ether. So this line over here increases the user's balance by the amount sent in. And then in the withdraw, so we have two functions. We can say that, let's say they're, they're buttons that you can press. So you can press the deposit and pass Ether in and increase your balance, or you can press the withdraw button and uh, uh, withdraw your money to your particular account. And this line here transfers the amount requested from the user to their account. And then the next line decreases the user's balance that we're storing inside the smart contract by the amount that they requested. Now, if there's any technical people in here, please don't say what the problems are because they should be immediately obvious if, if you're familiar, familiar with Solidity. However, there's a problem here. What happens if first user one deposits 10 Ether into the system, so we have 10 Ether stored in user one's balance, and then user two withdraws 10 Ether? We're not checking when we press the withdraw button. We're not checking that this user actually has uh, that amount of Ether to withdraw. We're just going to send out users one Ether to user two, right? So that's a problem. So what can we do? The smart contracts are defined by the logic which is actually implemented. We can implement the check to assure that we check that the particular user has that ether. So we can add this require statement. And this require statement does nothing more than check if the amount is greater or equal to the balance of this particular user. Fantastic, right? It looks like this code is now doing what it's supposed to do. But there's still a problem. There's a problem over here on these two lines where we're transferring the amount the user requested and we're decreasing the user's balance by the amount requested. And the, 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 the problem isn't obvious if you're not a coder. Um, to say the truth, it's even not obvious to many coders out there. The problem here has resulted in millions of euros lost. And it has to do with switching the statements and I'll explain why that has to be done. When we send an amount of cryptocurrency to a wallet, a wallet address that is going to receive this cryptocurrency, it can both be a wallet but it can also at the same time be another smart contract. And when we're sending money to another smart contract, that smart contract can execute code. So you could have code as soon as it receives that amount in that smart contract, which calls the same button again before we've managed to decrease the balance. And this malicious user can say, I want my 100 euros, call his smart contract, which calls the same withdrawal button again, and he'll end up getting another 100 euros, 200 euros, and he can keep doing that until this stops. So this is what we call the re-entrancy bug, and this has resulted in millions of euros uh, of, of uh, ether of lost. Now, this is just a few lines of code, and it's simple. And this is code that we've undergone testing, we've undergone verification, yet it still ended up being out there resulting in such large losses. So even simple code can be buggy. Smart contracts can be buggy, and we know that they are buggy, Yep. So the, the solution over here would be to just flip the lines. First, decrease the balance, then send the money to the smart contract. So as a pattern to get around this, what we do is we first perform any man manipulation of the state we store in the smart contract first, and then perform any execution that can have other contracts executing code outside of the smart contract at the very end of the code. So even if they call the same function again, we've already reduced their balance. Okay, so there's different types of bugs out there. So th let's say we wrote this code over here. Deposit, send it into the smart contract. And let's say we wrote a withdraw a function, but we forgot to include the transfer line. Now we have a contract that can't be changed where we can deposit money into, but we can never get it out. We can look at it, we can see the money in the contract, but we can never get it out. You could try to break Ethereum, you can do whatever you want, but that Ether is stuck in there. So th what the actual code executes is what is defined in the code. 
And as a user, then, I mean, in the beginning you would say, you have to understand the code as user. Code is law. Is that the right um, approach to take? I mean, if you're a programmer, you might say, sure, I'm willing to take that risk. But if you're an end user who's not a programmer, should we really be telling users, you have to agree to the code without understanding it? Yep. Um, so I would say, uh, more often than not, the answer is it depends. In Ethereum, I do not believe you can tell what type of account you're sending to, I'm not sure on that, but it depends on the architecture that you're using. If there was a function in the architecture that said, is this an account or is this a wallet? But that being said, I, I'm quite confident there isn't. Exactly. That's right, it's an address. And I don't believe there is a way of saying, is this address a wallet or a, because we always use this pattern. But there could be our other architectures where you could do that. And um, so even uh, simple code can be really buggy. And what do we usually do? If we think about what we do typically when we're developing, we have developer software tools, testing, static verification, runtime verification, and sometimes code fixes. So this is where there's a bit of a caveat. Sometimes we can update smart contract code. If we think a priori, if we think in advance when we're deploying the code that we might want to update some pieces of it and we provide the functionality to update that logic, we can update that logic and only that logic. But you have to think about it before. So there are ways of updating not that specific smart contract, but you upload a new smart contract and you can point a new reference to this new smart contract. So it's a way, it's a hack of how to update the, the, the logic in the contracts that you're deploying. But then the trade-off is, if you're deploying contracts that can be updated, what guarantees are you providing to your users? Can you just go and change the functionality without your users knowing? Perhaps users will not want to subscribe to certain smart contracts. In certain scenarios, sometimes when updating smart contracts, um, people would have to vote in the system to decide who, when we can actually deploy an update. So you might use a consensus mechanism to decide when to update smart contracts. And we have all of these tools inside of the blockchain world. Um, again, code fixes we can't always do. So if there is a bug and the bug is there in the code and it's immutable and we haven't thought about updating this particular functionality, is the bug there forever? Yep, the bug is there forever and there's nothing we can do about it. Now, can we update code? I need to change this to this slide. Can we update logic? So can we update code, the actual code itself? No. Can we update the logic? Yes, we can up update the logic using these workarounds that I mentioned. So what does this mean to the users? If the smart contract code can be changed, then the users have no guarantee, right? And that's important to keep. So I, as a user, would never sign up to a smart contract where that functionality could be changed just by the owner of that smart contract. I mean, it's no longer essentially a smart contract. You're trusting the, that, uh, that uh, deployer as the central authority in that particular case. So, so we're seeing very similar um, attributes to hardware and critical systems. Systems that we cannot update. Bugs could have critically high costs. And if we look at these similar industries where we're using these types of systems, let's say the um, aviation industry, what is typically done? We get independent audits of the technology to assure that that technology is going to be of the adequate safety that we expect. And this is where the MDIA comes in, the Multi-Digital Innovation Authority. The Multi-Digital Innovation Authority set up this regime where we approve, we, um, uh, we vet, we interview, we do due diligence on independent systems auditors to assure that they have the level of quality to be able to look at different technology that's going to be released out there to come up the opinion that yes, the implementation is actually doing what the operators are claiming that it does. So what happens when someone comes with their technology that they want to get a, a certification for is the applicant comes with their particular blueprint, an English description, of what the system should be doing and their code and any other artifacts, they come with their application, they go to an approved systems auditor, an MDI approved systems auditor who has undergone this due diligence process, and then when they are of the opinion that yes, the technology is actually doing what it's meant to do, they will certify that application with the MDIA. Now, what sort of assurances are we providing through this framework? We're providing applicant due diligence, which we're undertaking when they apply for uh, their particular technology audit. 
we're providing technical due diligence. Now, this is really where we're setting Malta apart from the other jurisdictions. Uh, no other jurisdiction yet has provided technical due diligence on the technology. So we're getting an independent systems auditor report that the technology is doing what, it, uh, what the applicant claims that it does. We have an identifiable known legal entity who can now be taken up to court if required for whatever it is that they should be taken to court for. We also have information stored in a forensic node. We could require that when someone applies for an ITA, which is certified with us, that they have a forensic node that stores all the data associated with the particular innovative technology arrangement. And when we say innovative technology arrangement, that currently includes blockchain DLP and smart contract-based systems. And we might open that up for new types of innovative technologies in the future. So we have this forensic node that investigators can now take away to get to the bottom of what went wrong. We also require the appointing of a technical administrator, someone who we can contact to say, listen, we need access to the forensic node, we need certain information, we need you to stop certain functionality. Now I know when we're talking about a blockchain decentralized system, there's a lot of functionality you can't stop. So when an ITA is registering with us, they need to provide justification of what functionality um, that they cannot stop. So we require full powers of intervention in the technology, but where it is not doable and where it's justifiable, the applicant can specify uh, for either market-based reasons or technical reasons that it can't be done. And overall, if the system gets through, it's doing what it's supposed to do, but yet still a bug crops up, because bugs can still crop up, um, the English description prevails over the implementation. So as the user, you can take the particular applicant up to court and sue them because the description of what it was supposed to do wasn't upheld in code. So when we were working on the laws and on the setup of the functionality, uh, we started to realize that there is really a need for multidisciplinary teams that we're having, we're looking at technical due diligence, financial due diligence, and legal due diligence, and we started to note that we really need this multidisciplinary team to be set up. And this is just a side point where at the University of Malta, we've set up a new multidisciplinary masters in blockchain and DLP, which allows for uh, individuals, graduates, to come in with either a law, a business, or technical background, and get advanced knowledge in, let's say, the technical area of blockchain, but also get an introduction to law, an introduction to business in the blockchain area. So we will also be introducing our business and our law students to smart contract programming, or more than programming, smart contract literacy. So that's it, if there's any time qu for questions. Any questions? So um, in relation to um, open source, open decentralized um, uh, platforms, um, um, when it comes to the role of the technical administrator, is there a change in his particular role as opposed to, let's say, um, permissioned uh, closed source uh, technology arrangements? So the technical administrator is the person who the applicant defines to be that individual who will be the person to contact. And we need a known person, right? So it's not necessarily the same person who's handling the technical administration of the, so of the open source project themselves. So it's not, um, it could be, but it's not necessarily that person. Um, when talking about open source projects, um, the, our, our model could be applied quite nicely to different types of open source projects. N now that we have this regime of providing assurances on technology, should we also be considering all types of technology, not just blockchain DLP? Because when we're talking about an open source community developing things around the world, uh, wh how are we going to give assurances to the users of the system? So can we come up with a regime which is more adequate for all types of open source projects is something we're currently considering. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Round of applause. Thank you very much, Dr. Alul. And of course, this is another prime example of how Malta is, uh, I would say, one of the leading jurisdictions when it comes to the um, holistic regulatory framework that has been enacted. We're not just focusing on the legal and the financial parts, but we're also covering the technical aspect as well. I hope you found um, uh, this session um, useful, and uh, I'd like to welcome on stage a person without whom blockchain advisory would not have been possible. This is my colleague, um, Anton Dalli. I normally take care, part, uh, take care of the regulatory aspect. He takes care of the technical aspect, so we complement each other quite well. So another round of applause, please, for Anton.
Thank you, Jonathan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's way due past uh, lunchtime, so I promise I'm not going to keep you too long. Uh, I hope you found this uh, workshop this morning uh, useful and fruitful. Um, I think we've covered various aspects related to the DLT, um, uh, ARENA, both here in Malta and internationally. Um, uh, various topics were discussed in relation to cryptocurrency exchanges, the aspects of running a regulated exchange in a regulated environment such as in Malta. Um, uh, there was quite an interesting panel before which discussed ICOs and STOs and uh, the move from ICOs to STOs recently, the new phenomena related to IEOs and what's coming, um, the educative aspect, it's a new technology, so education plays a very important role in this new technology. Um, we also um, discussed, um, and I think Josh um, had a very, very insightful presentation and one who, so for someone who is not technical, it's important to understand um, that although we say that blockchain is a secure technology, obviously it depends on the developer that de is developing that system. And lastly, but not least, we also mentioned the tax implications, especially here in Malta, when it comes to uh, crypto assets. I think we are only, we have only um, uh, mentioned very few topics um, that will uh, play a very important role in the future here in Malta. Um, apart from the regulatory aspect, I think Malta is playing an important role in building the ecosystem that is required to actually attract uh, companies, both um, uh, companies that are already operating in the industry, but also those startups with projects, innovative projects that aim to actually implement projects that will be used by businesses in the traditional uh, sense and also the public at large. I think this will play a very important role in the future because obviously it's useless. We have all these conferences, we're always speaking, but we do not have real life applications for the blockchain. So I think that is a very next important next step. Obviously for those companies that need or want to set up in Malta, one requires support locally. Um, we as blockchain advisory can um, offer such support um, we can offer VFA agent services. We can offer systems auditor services, which um, uh, Dr. Elul was mentioning before. And obviously regulatory and technical advisory around this industry. So for those of you who wish to discuss further any requirements you might have, we have a stand downstairs on the ground floor, G plus one. Um, myself, Jonathan, or any other member of our team will be more than pleased to answer any questions you might have, including any questions you have now, obviously. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, which unfortunately also was one of the um, let's say black spots in Bitcoin's history, which is of course the Mount Gox exchange. However, before moving on to uh, um, uh, the, the, let's say, timeline of exchanges, just for the sake of uh, information, an exchange is uh, uh, basically a platform on which um, uh, DLT assets um, uh, can be exchanged from one crypto asset to the other. And there are a few exchanges um, that also allow for the exchange between um, uh, cryptocurrencies and fiat currencies. And normally an exchange offers the following uh, services. There is uh, basically listing criteria whenever you want to list an exchange. Of course, we're talking about the decentralized or the hybrid um, exchanges. There is also um, order matching, which is normally um, automated. There is definitely the uh, function that is offered by most exchanges, which is that of custodianship. And uh, last but not least, of course, there is the asset exchange function. 
So now that we all, uh, we're all familiar with how an exchange works, let's move on to the timeline of some notable incidents in the past when it comes to exchanges. As you can see from this timeline, we've uh, had various incidents in the past which have somehow marred the history of uh, exchanges. Although I would say that the industry has grown at a very, very rapid pace, this has not come without its own sacrifices. So the most notable um, incident was, of course, that of Mt. Gox. I don't need to remind, uh, I guess, the audience of what happened back in 2011 and even 2014, where over 850,000 bitcoins had been stolen. Um, uh, there were various other exchanges which also unfortunately suffered various incidents. Cryptsy, Mintpal, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, and uh, lately we also had Coincheck, Coinrail, Bitgrail, and various other exchanges. So what have we learned from all of this? Well, hopefully we have learned quite a few lessons. I think the most important one is that even if you're dealing with cryptocurrencies, you are not above the law. If you're offering a service to end clients, you have to take the responsibility of the services that you are offering. Even just as importantly, we're talking about something which has monetary value. We're not talking about monopoly money anymore. We're talking about something which has real world value. So of course, you need to protect it. We need to have beefed up cybersecurity measures. After the Mt. Gox incident, um, uh, various exchanges also implemented um, uh, withdrawal queuing uh, procedures and, of course, processing um, uh, withdrawal requests chronologically. Um, uh, there have also been reward programs for um, bug um, identifications. Um, uh, users have also educated themselves and tried to avoid long-term storage on cryptocurrency exchanges and only keep the funds on there which they need to transact with. Um, exchanges have also implemented a mix of hot and cold wallet, um, encryption of um, the servers where data is being stored, and various other measures which, of course, have helped make the industry quite safer for users. Now we move on to how the regulatory framework is, uh, of course, um, enshrining this particular industry. And I would say that one of the pillar stones of the regulation that applies to exchanges is precisely AML, anti-money laundering. And this has, of course, always been one of the main concerns for the regulators. In the past, um, uh, Bitcoin was uh, used on some platforms such as uh, Silk Road. We've moved beyond that. People are now actually recognizing the fact that, again, Bitcoin is not just a tool for money launderers. It goes way beyond that in terms of positive use. And it is basically something that actually affords the regulators more oversight than traditional fiat systems. The fifth EU AML directive, in fact, uh, regulates, um, or rather would seek to regulate exchanges and wallet service providers. The Maltese legislation goes beyond that and also brings within its remit other service providers and also issuers. Normally, under traditional systems, um, uh, the persons are known, but the transactions tend to be unknown, especially on in cash-focused um, uh, um, economic systems. Cryptocurrencies tend to follow another pattern altogether, whereby initially the person might be unknown, but the transaction is always, always known. At least, of course, in those ledgers which do not obfuscate the transactions. So therefore, I would say that this new paradigm shift might make actually make it easier for the regulators to have oversight over transactions if they manage to identify the, um, uh, the users from the get-go. Naturally, this would require, of course, the collection of uh, due diligence documents. Earlier on, I mentioned that, again, there are some uh, ledgers, some cryptocurrencies, which obfuscate the transactions, the so-called privacy-focused coins. Although some jurisdictions have uh, taken a blanket approach and decided to ban all privacy coins altogether, I would say that legislators and regulators need to, um, I, I guess, separate those privacy coins which offer privacy as an optional feature and those privacy coins which I would say um, uh, offer uh, um, obligatory um, uh, privacy um, altogether. Reason is that 
for those users who want to be in line with um, due diligence procedures and so on and so forth, they can always, of course, decide to uh, do away with the privacy feature. So, of course, we should not look at the project um, uh, simply as and labeling it as a privacy focused project, but rather we should see what the functions that, um, that are being afforded to users really are. One of the headaches um, uh, for service providers and for regulator, regulators alike in this industry remains source of wealth. We're not talking about source of funds um, because basically source of funds can always be um, verified in one way or another. But when actually dealing with people who might have um, their source of wealth as coming in from, uh, let's say, mostly cryptocurrencies, it might be the case, or rather it is often the case, that people who generated their wealth in cryptocurrencies had invested in them a number of years ago. Let's say four or five years ago, when there were absolutely barely any, um, I would say, tools in order to, uh, to track how you're actually um, investing and training your cryptocurrencies, where still, even if you were using certain exchanges, it is quite likely that those exchanges have shut down and therefore you can't request any records for any transaction history. So when you go and submit your documentation and people ask you to actually uh, substantiate your source of wealth with, let's say, transaction history, and you're unable to provide it, that indeed is a bit of a stumbling block. There's also another issue with regards to the verification of the owners of wallet addresses. And although there are various methods which one can potentially use, such as, for example, sending um, um, a small amount in tokens to verify that you are the owner, in the case of Bitcoin, potentially making use of colored coins, and so on and so forth, this, of course, remains a bit of an issue since private keys can easily be trans well, given to one person or another. Some exchanges are also making use of the so-called crypto forensic service providers. However, I haven't yet seen anyone just providing a perfect solution to this particular issue. Still, at least, solutions are being worked upon. One other, um, uh, let's say, ugly serpent in this industry is uh, market abuse. So, uh, unfortunately, over the past few years, um, uh, there have been some clear signs of market manipulation taking place. Some of them involving uh, wash trading, pumps and dumps, bear raiding, market cornering, and other methods. The industry, of course, is moving to a more mature stage. However, unfortunately, we are still seeing some signs of these practices. And this is mostly due to the lack of regulation and especially the fact that most of these coins have a small market cap, therefore making manipulation a lot easier. You only need, in some cases even, just a few thousand worth of dollars in that particular cryptocurrency to organize a pump and dump. And again, financial audits are not always conducted. We also, of course, um, uh, have the, the fact that there are still um, uh, a lot of jurisdictions that are not regulating the space and therefore there's no need for financial auditing and so on and so forth. And of course, these practices are instilling doubts in the mind of regulators. What I would say is that there needs to be international cooperation in the space. Cryptocurrencies are, again, global reaching. So therefore, we cannot just, again, look at legislation on a local level, but rather there needs to be international initiatives. And in fact, from our end, for example, we are currently trying to work on an international initiative to push for exchange transparency. We have been in touch with the Japanese regulator, the Maltese regulator, and other regulators as well. And we are trying, of course, to push towards more transparency in this industry. The elephant in the room, cybersecurity. Again, as I mentioned, there have been various incidents in the past, and this remains one of the major concerns. Criminals are no longer raiding old people's homes and searching for money under mattresses. They are now targeting um, uh, exchanges, banks, and other, of course, uh, service providers or license, license entities which are holding a large stash of money. And... Uh, Apart from that, there's also the technical infrastructure being used um, in this industry. We are, of course, advancing at a very rapid pace. But still, trading engines, for example, we have, we have seen various exchanges in the last couple of years simply coming to a halt because they couldn't withstand the sudden increase um, in trading volume. 
and cybersecurity, as well as providing an efficient platform for trading, are two obligations which you actually owe to the traders, to the users. The terms and conditions should actually stipulate that you can provide a safe place for business for these users. You cannot escape from your regulations. We talked about financial auditing in the last slide. Again, technical audits. How many exchanges are actually undergoing these kind of technical audits? What happens in the case of loss of funds? What are the remedies? Should we simply tell the users that we cannot refund you? Should we simply tell the users that we, go we are going to split the losses equally amongst all the users? That is not, of course, the right approach to take. Again, custodial safeguards. Make sure they have the required infrastructure in place. In terms of technical developments, we are seeing, of course, um, hybrid decentralized exchanges cropping up, which are, of course, addressing some of the concerns that we have. But again, we don't have the perfect solution yet. We need to strive for technical perfection. That is the aim that we should have when dealing with this industry. So what is the future of, uh, of exchanges? What does the future hold for these service providers? First of all, centralized exchanges are becoming more regulated. Japan, Malta, Gibraltar, there are various other jurisdictions which are offering a framework for the regulation of centralized exchanges. Cybersecurity measures are also being given a lot more importance. I met with the Japanese FSA three weeks ago, and from their end, they are looking to also implement certain cybersecurity measures within the regulation. We are seeing the emergence of decentralized exchanges. And although, of course, again, it's one of the technological breakthroughs, thanks to blockchain technology, there is still some way to go for pure decentralized exchanges to really thrive. The, the technology especially needs to mature further. And we're also seeing examples of atomic swaps, whereby, again, you have a cryptocurrency, um, which is uh, basically uh, transferred from one blockchain to another. And although this makes the transfer of cryptocurrency easier, it does not provide a marketplace. So therefore, they are not the answer for, let's say, um, the creation of actual, um, I would say, volume, the creation of an actual market for those who wish to trade cryptocurrencies. Contrary to popular belief, if you have a decentralized exchange that has certain centralized elements, you may still be subject to regulation. As soon as there is a point which is centralized, you are no longer a decentralized exchange, but you become a hybrid um, uh, DEX. So therefore, you that would mean that you would be, of course, um, uh, depending on the jurisdiction where you set up in, liable to um, comply with certain um, uh, regulations. Having said that, with the technology maturing further, pure decentralized exchanges might um, uh, actually give a bit of a headache to the regulators. How are you going to regulate something which is purely decentralized with no um, answerable person to that, no one who's responsible for it? Will you target the end users? Will you target the technical infrastructure itself? Uh, personally, I don't think so, but hey, we're all on this uh, together, so we'll see how this will develop. And a very interesting uh, development that we're seeing is that exchanges are almost becoming banks in their own right offering custodianship, offering potentially certain lending solutions, especially if the, if the jurisdiction where you set up in doesn't regulate crypto assets in any way, form, or shape whatsoever. So you're basically free to offer any services in relation to those crypto assets, even if those services are mostly um, assimilated to what banks normally offer. So, of course, I'd like to close off this presentation with what Malta is doing in this space and uh, how our regime is different. We haven't gone for a light touch approach. We have actually regulated this industry from the ground up. So we're not offering any concessions, we're not offering any light touch legislation. We're actually offering full blown licensing frameworks. Um, and for example, the licensing framework um, caters for, first of all, significant share capital requirements. In order to set up an exchange, you need a minimum share capital of 730,000 euro. That is for the exchanges. Custodians, you require 125,000 as minimum share capital. Depends on the class of license under which you're applying. This, of course, provides peace of mind to the regulators and to the users alike that you have enough float to, of course, continue running your business. Extensive due diligence, as I said, issuers, the service providers such, such, such as the exchanges, 
and uh, also the agents servicing the industry, they are all subject persons under a local AML legislation. We also, uh, of course, have a clear token classification regime. We don't just stick our finger up in the air, see where the, where the wind is blowing and say, okay, this might be a security, this might be a utility. No, we have a clear four-tiered classification system offering legal clarity in the space. Fitness and properness. Every time there is someone conducting a service here in Malta, doing an issuance, even listening on an exchange, the agents are responsible for conducting the fitness and properness test to ensure that the persons conducting services here in Malta are above board. The competent authorities, namely the Malta Financial Service Authority and the Malta Digital Innovation Authority, are of course constantly monitoring the industry. Cybersecurity guidelines applicable to service providers and even enhanced systems audit requirements for those service providers which are especially dealing with custodianship. We want to ensure that there's a safe place of business, not just for the persons um, actually running the business, but also for the users and the investors alike. And there's also the requirement for key functionaries to be appointed um, uh, for those uh, service providers and issuers, namely the money laundering reporting officers, compliance officers, financial auditors, VFA agents, systems auditors, and so on and so forth. So hopefully, with this uh, regulatory framework, we um, uh, introduce an element of legal clarity in the space, and I believe that all in all, the whole industry is moving towards a more regulated, towards a safer environment for all. Thank you. So for the next session, I would like to welcome on stage Dr. Jeppe Stockholm from uh, Amazix, um, uh, who will be conducting um, a panel uh, titled ICOs versus STOs, Friends or Foes. Basically, the whole point of the panel will be to discuss the recent development in STOs, how it compares to ICOs, and of course, various other um, uh, innovative points aside. So thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And uh, I'm very honored to be here today, being in, on Malta and, and talk about uh, this uh, very big development we have in, in this space. Because uh, what we are witness to here now is uh, an area that is rapidly uh, developing. But uh, I would very much like all my panelists to enter uh, the stage. So uh, please give them a hand while they come up here. And then uh, I will make the formal introduction up here. So, Mr. Jolo, and uh, okay, he's coming. Okay, so we have a, a third panelist. He will be arriving, but we can already uh, start here. So, uh, basically, we are here to talk about uh, security token offerings and uh, initial coin offerings, but also exchange offerings. But uh, I know that uh, you all have uh, different profiles. I mean, I'm a lawyer myself. I come from uh, Amasics. We are a global advisory company. We have uh, done a lot of research in this area. The last year we have um, uh, been through more than 300 different uh, projects. And very interesting is that uh, everyone is always asking us, what do the investors want? And I mean, you, you come from uh, this space, from uh, VCs and uh, etc. So can you please introduce yourself and uh, tell a little bit of what, what you're doing? Yeah, hi, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Randa Misra. I'm chairman and CEO of a company called GMEX Group. I mean, GMEX um, operates all over the world in terms of setting up um, and operating, investing to regulated exchanges, originally in the traditional space, but then over the last uh, two years, quite heavily in the digital exchange and digital custody space. And so, you know, we're seeing some very interesting developments uh, and the market involve uh, from the perspective of setting up those exchanges, but also listing, whether it's various forms of tokens, but also now moving to more asset-backed tokens as well. Perfect. And Mr. Law, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, my name is Jor Law. I'm a corporate securities attorney. I actually wear multiple hats in the space now that I don't practice law. Um, I've consulted and helped build the infrastructure and ecosystem around security tokens. Um, and primarily, I, I built a company called Verify Investor. It does accrediting investor verification. 
I got a company called Prime Trust into the blockchain space, and they now power uh, a quite a large number of the security token issuance platforms, and also service many of the large exchange, uh, crypto exchanges. Um, I built the private issuance business of T0, which uh, many people know as a secondary exchange uh, or secondary trading platform, but they also have a primary um, issuance platform which I built for them. And then also I helped architect Polymath's ST20 um, token protocol and helped them build that out. And Mr. Matsura? Yeah, terrific. Uh, is, this, is this working? This one's better, <laughs> yes. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Miko, and uh, I principally wear two hats. One of them is as an entrepreneur. So I'm a co-founder of uh, Evercoin. So Evercoin is a mobile-first wallet and exchange. So if you have an iPhone or Android phone, check it out, Evercoin. Uh, the other hat that I wear is I'm a venture investor. So uh, I work for, I'm a general partner with Gumi Cryptos, and Gumi Cryptos is a $30 million dollar uh, venture fund that's very narrowly focused on exposure to startups in the cryptographic asset space. So, you know, I think people really use the term blockchain. And they're really kind of taking a broad view. Our view is a little more narrow. Like, our view is re really more about kind of cryptographic assets and about kind of this emerging financial uh, system. So uh, that, that's, that's pretty much myself. Perfect. So now we are ready to really kickstart this legal panel. And uh, normally people would think legal panels, pretty boring. What can we do? How can we survive? So right now we have 30 minutes and I really want this to be very dynamic. So if you have any questions out there, please raise your hand. And up here, if anyone is speaking anything that is boring, you'll be kicked out. So it's just a, a disclaimer Legally. right from the start. Perfect. <laughs> so. I will start with you, uh, Mr. Law, because um, you have uh, a very big experience in regulatory affairs. And when we look into crowdfunding, financial crowdfunding, and the uh, different ways uh, of doing it, then we all know that it's a big difference between ICOs and the security token offering. But can you just, just start with introducing the biggest differences and, and, and what it is that is really important to focus on? Yeah, you know, um, it, it really depends on what jurisdiction you are, uh, you know, what ICO is and, and, um, and how it relates to STO. But fundamentally, I think a STOs can be viewed as a subset of the ICO. If you think of ICO as uh, any sort of initial coin offering, if it happens that your jurisdiction or juris jurisdictions you sell into uh, treat that the underlying token that you're selling as a security or your method of selling those tokens as some type of securities offering, uh, then effectively your ICO becomes uh, what people call a STO. And I think that's fundamentally uh, the biggest difference. Um, uh, wh what does that really mean, right? Uh, it, re it really just means that because you're touching securities in uh, a regulated product as securities, uh, that you fall under the regulation of securities laws. Uh, it also means that if you're not a security, it doesn't necessarily mean you're unregulated. You might just be regulated under other types of laws. Yeah, and then we have this new dark horse in the room. Everyone now is talking about exchange offerings. So Miko, can you please uh, tell us a little bit? Now we heard about the uh, STOs and ICOs, but exchange offerings. Yes. What kind of animal uh, is that? I'm, so my view is, I'm from the US, and like ICOs aren't a thing anymore, right? And I'm, I'm an venture investor. So in the US, like ICOs are really, you know, generally speaking, like, almost all of the tokens are viewed by the SEC as securities, right? right? So because of that, there really isn't an ICO. Like all ICOs are STOs in the, according to the US, right? So that's my jurisdiction. Uh, we invest globally, but I would say this is, I'm actually, I'll tell you why I'm excited about IEO, initial exchange offering. So just to define it, it's really that the exchange is offering the token instead of like the issuer, right? Why is this important? I'll tell you why it's important. When we look at ICO, what happened was, was there's 10,000 ICOs, right? And so everybody was just throwing everything to the wind. And you know what became popular? What became popular is you fill a grocery bag full of cash, and then you hand it to someone who you never met on the internet, right? That was an ICO, right? It's just, it's ridiculous. And what is that? It's the degradation and commoditization of diligence, right? Which means that diligence is worth nothing, 
right? So the ICO, thing I, I hate about the ICO era is dil the value of diligence went to zero. And we saw the result, right? Which is the result was like scams and the result was, was terrible. The thing I like about I IEO is that the exchange is the gatekeeper. So I think Jor, as like a regulatory expert, will really appreciate that word because the word gatekeeper means something to a regulator, right? Regulators love gatekeepers because a regulator can punish a gatekeeper, right? So there's two forces at work. The exchange acts in two ways. One of them is as a regulatory gatekeeper, right? So if there's an exchange that's pumping out scam coins, the regulator will just crush the exchange and it's over, right? Which is great. Hmm? So from a regulatory perspective, IEO is nice. The other perspective though, is that the exchange is also acting as a diligence function, right? And the thing that's wonderful is, is there will only be two kinds of exchanges for IEO. There will be exchanges that impoverish their user base by putting out shit coins, and there will be exchanges that enrich their user base by I putting out I things that rise in value. So, 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 so just to yeah. put the, the final capstone on it, like the thing I like about IEO is that it produces a value for diligence, right? And that, that it's actually a competition between different diligence models and the ones that are bad will just die, right? So I think that that's the restoring of, of diligence to our ecosystem. So I like IEO. Yes, and you also mentioned uh, the word death a couple of times here because <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned that uh, something will die and uh, there's this development all the time, which reminds me of uh, Schumpeter when we talked about uh, economic development. And uh, basically his uh, theory is that um, there will always be this creative disruption in the market, that uh, there will always be a need to do something in, in a different way. However, uh, we can all agree on then doing things in a different way. And then when it comes to the legal system, then sometimes the tech development move very more fast than the regulatory uh, space. And that is quite interesting here because you said an interesting point again regarding death. And I, and I know a lot about death because I'm a tax lawyer <laughs> and there's <laughs> only two things here in life, there are death and taxes, right? Th they are for sure. But when we look into the US market, you said that the utility tokens are dead. But do you all agree into that statement that utility tokens are dead? I know you said US market, yeah. but what about the uh, Asian market or the European market? Do they see them dead there? I mean, the, the death element's an interesting one. I, I wrote a blog about a couple of months ago and I said, the I mean, you have the traditional exchange model on the one hand, and then you had the wild west of the crypto exchanges uh, on the other hand. And I said, well, actually, both are going to die. And ultimately, the right answer is something in between. And whether it's IEOs, you know, STOs on exchanges, that hits that spe sweet spot uh, in the middle. And, and you're right, you know, it boils down to, I mean, ultimately trust, because with ICOs, um, I mean, when they started out, they were game changing, actually. There was an element of real utility, a real network value, and then people abused it. And now, you know, investors that went into it, I mean, most of us, you know, once bit into our shy, we, we, we don't like losing money. So once, once they were in, this happened, the trust went away, and, and that's where now we're going towards asset backing. But asset backing itself needs to be looked at because, you know, we're, we're seeing a number of STOs out there. And if you package rubbish, it's still rubbish, you know, no matter how you package it, right? And so you've got kind of a lot of STOs being touted, but actually uh, the lessons haven't necessarily been learned from ICOs. There's a few number of ICOs, but, you know, we're still involved in one uh, related to gold. There are a number of others out there. Um, you know, there's a company called Scrumble uh, alongside after Telegram. They were the su second most successful ICO last year, uh, a Canadian firm, but they have an Asian user base. So there's still a market in some jurisdictions for good ICOs, but now, I mean, I do agree we're moving towards asset backing and trust is key and we'll touch upon some of that as well. So when you mentioned the word uh, rubbish and uh, you mentioned the trash and uh, we look into the different kind of tokens. No, but, but I mean, uh, we, we need to, uh, I love a panel here uh, talking legally, but, but using other kind of uh, wording. Uh, when we talk about the uh, token economics and we look into utility tokens versus uh, security tokens and maybe also the interest of conflict between the ultimate owners, the, the shareholders, and then the investors in the utility token. And we then look into, again, the investors. 
what do they prefer? Investors today, do they prefer an asset-backed token, a security token, or is it something else they are looking for? So, so I feel like that our industry suffers from a disease, and I, I call it telegram-itis, <laughs> right? And what it, the reason why I'm objecting is I'm objecting to the polarities that arise in telegram, right? So the, to me, for example, security token versus utility token is actually like, if you wanna talk about garbage, like that's a garbage distinction, right? And the reason it's a garbage distinction is, is it, it confuses the regulatory view, security token, with the functional view, which is utility token, right? So to me, you know, what, what I love is like, like, like you said something wonderful, which was asset backing, right? So to me, I t my taxonomy is asset backed and service backed. Right, so something can be backed by an asset or a service, and that taxonomy, or nothing, nothing backed, <laughs> right? And my third category, nothing backed, includes things like Bitcoin, right, which are effectively what you could call an infrastructure token, right? So that taxonomy is actually functional, but it doesn't conflate the securities distinctions in the sense that a utility token may also be a security. So the yeah, so phrase yeah. security token is very, very meaningless. So, so I really wanted to kind of like rubbish that terminology because I think the debate is meaningful. Like the debate is meaningful whether, whether it is uh, service backed or whether it's asset backed. And I think that's a big issue. As an investor, we don't actually run away. We actually prefer service backed, believe it or not. We're venture investors, right? But in the US, if we're investing, the service-backed tokens are regulated as securities, largely. I mean, I mean nothing backed is an interesting concept because if you look at, I mean, we all know Bretton Woods went away between 71 and 73, where gold was no longer backing fiat currencies. And whilst I'm not a big proponent of out-and-out um, -out cryptocurrencies, I'm an asset-backed kind of guy, but I mean, ultimately, what's backing the dollar or other fiat currencies now? Nothing, you know, and there's negative reserve in a lot of these economies, right? So, you know, there's going to be a move towards real assets, whether we digitize them or not. But, but I think what you said was good, which was taxes. Right? Exactly. Right. So the U.S. dollar is backed by taxes. Right. And it's also backed by debt. Right. Because if you look at the, you know, the United States military and its presence all over the planet. Right. So to me, death and taxes are actually backing <laughs> the U.S. And, dollar. And, and, <laughs> um. and we have an, an, another combination here between uh, death, taxes and then blockchain. In fact, because um, uh, OECD um, really tried in a long time to find some basic rules, how to uh, make some definitions on uh, taxes and how to avoid double taxation. And right now, OECD have made this group that are focusing on blockchain area, how to make some definitions we all can agree to. And all the people sitting in that group are former tax lawyers. So basically, we are, we are dealing with the same uh, terminology here. But Mr. Law, what is your point into the regulatory area we are talking about here? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I agree with Miko. It, it was unfortunate that people kind of treated it as one versus the other because they aren't mutually exclusive, right? The, the question should have been, are, do you have utility? Are you a service token? Are you a payment token? Uh, and then finally, you know, are you a security survivor or have you sold it as a security? Um, the, you know, um, as for the type of investors, I think that seek out each one. It, it really depends on your investment style and uh, whether you're a trader, right? If you're a trader, as long as there's action and volatility, it's probably good enough. Uh, and it also imp uh, depends on how you analyze it, right? Like if it's a asset backed token, if it's a, a, a something more uh, akin to equity or uh, securities, uh, you might view th you might analyze that closer to a investment, right? And if it's something like a service uh, token, then you look at the token economics to kind of see what the scarcity of that uh, service will be, uh, you know, when it's linked up with the token. So there's various kind of different ways to kind of analyze that, and I think you attract different investors to different types of okay. tokens. So now we try to play a little game here. We now uh, think that uh, we have this brilliant uh, company. We now want to present to a family office in Geneva. Mm -hmm. And these guys are extremely conservative. So how will you pitch that family office in Geneva? What benefit will you uh, say that there is into a token compared with a, an ordinary uh, share or maybe an IPO? I mean, uh, why should a family office, an extremely conservative family office in Geneva, ever consider investing in a token? 
Uh, so, so for me, if I'm doing such a pitch, <laughs> there's a certain partner I look for, right? And I look, I look for actually the junior partner with the family name, right? And if you look inside of that partner's portfolio, what you're going to see is you're going to see Bitcoin, mm -hmm. cannabis, yep. and video games. <laughs> and this partner's father thinks he's an idiot <laughs> that wants to stay at home earning Bitcoins by playing video games while smoking cannabis. Exactly. <laughs> that's life. That's life. So that's, great, the, partner, great, that's the partner that I pitch. I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> Is he Canadian? By any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, looking, looking at this, I mean, we've had exposure to this in um, Monaco, for example, where, you know, you go into a kind of wooden walled room with cognac in the corner. And, and you've got these investors that are interested, but what happened was they don't really understand what they're invested into. And some of them have had their fingers burnt because you know they've been touted some of the rubbish that we've been speaking about. So now it's boiling down to trust. I mean, you've got a number of funds emerging now as well that they're putting money into. I mean, Denise Gardier, who's speaking uh, on one of the other streams, um, he's got one such one that he's set up. We're setting one up uh, as well in a jurisdiction, but ultimately it boils down to trust because if you look at family office investors, but equally now there's lots of hype around institutional investors coming into this marketplace. But actually what they're looking for is something that's similar to what they've already been using. We're all creatures of habit, especially when it comes to these traditional investors. And whether, whether we know the market's gonna move to a different type of investment or not, whatever they've been used to, they've been used to VCC type, you know, um, PE type VC private investment or uh, listed equity or some type of security or other products on the other hand, whereas now you're trying to give them STOs in the middle. I mean, there are advantages because obviously VCP, um, you can list those tokens as a level of liquidity on, on a tokenized market. We've worked out it's about 90% cheaper than even a IPO on a junior, junior market on an exchange. But ultimately it boils down to, you know, when we ask them, they want the right level of administration, they want the right level of custody, they want a method to value these things and they want a method for entry and exit. And actually the market's moving really fast because you know, six months ago, I mean, because I, I guess um, it, uh, trading or offering crypto is counterproductive to some of these banks, right? And, and these are kind of large blue chips and they're kind of all kind of banding together and creating their own private blockchain so that they can keep the market between themselves. But now we're working with one where in the next six months we're gonna be announcing with them and a very, very large broker the launch of crypto custody, and this is in the mainstream banking world. We're not talking security tokens um, only, we're talking mainstream crypto. So the big boys are getting into it because they realize that they can't stay on the outside. So my personal view here is that uh, what we really want to see now is some very big use cases where people are not focusing so much on the underlying technology, but basically here is a solution and it works. So what do you predict here? What can we expect to see of perfectly nice use cases within this area within the next uh, six months? Are you aware of any, any interesting projects we should look at? Well, I, I think, you know, in, in the STL space at least, right, um, you, you are getting some major institutional players that have been looking at it. And you have some, some kind of endowments that have already invested in certain types of ICOs slash STOs. So I think, um, you know, given the conversations that I've seen kind of at, uh, in my role at T0 or at Polymath uh, or at Prime Trust, um, we see that the, the type of people that were interested in putting these deals together uh, at the end of 2017 and 2018, um, it's uh, very different from the type of people that are looking at it now. So, you know, we're, we're now on calls with Goldman Sachs, SockGen, things like that. And I think over the next six months, you will start seeing uh, an emergence of STO that actually is backed by some sort of quality. And Miko? Uh, yeah, so uh, I was just in New York uh, at the New York Consensus, and you know, to me, the there are huge emerging use cases coming, but you know, one person I had lunch with is uh, Dovi Wan from Primitive Ventures, and her thesis is that the applications that we're going to see will be primitive, right? And primitive applications, right? So things like payments, right? So very basic applications, but the thing I'm really interested in is, you know, look at something like Facebook, right? Facebook is working on a project called Libra, which will bring 2.5 billion monthly active users into the crypto space. So like, 
that's a use case, right? And I think it'll just be stable payment coins, right? But I, to me, when you look at applications, I think there will be very simple applications. Uh, I do think that gaming is actually going to be pretty serious, and it's already taking off like a rocket. So, you know, I definitely see a huge wave, especially if the messengers come with the user, because it's not just Facebook. It's Telegram, it's Signal, it's Kakao, it's Line, you know, so Asian messengers, European messengers, global messengers, you know, uh, Kick Messenger, like they're all in. So it's, a, yeah. it's very, very big. So we are rushing into the end of this session. So I kindly ask, are there anyone here who have any kind of questions for these uh, brilliant minds up here? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one, one of the biggest trends actually is that the power base has shifted from private presale to the exchange. So I was speaking with uh, Mo, who's the CEO of Seller, and Seller did Binance Launchpad. And one of the things CZ said to Mo was, was you will not IEO on Binance at a price where your previous private sale investors can dump on Binance customers. So your price, your launch price is going to be lower. So, so my retail customers will get a better deal than your VCs, right? <laughs> than invested in like seed stage, right? Which is amazing. So the power has really shifted and that's a very major trend. So what it means is it means private presale has kind of died, right? And that the power has come into the exchange. It's, which in a way is democratization. And one of the other things that's nice about it is, is that the uh, allocations are sliced very small. So they're retail sized allocations, which I think is it's a very, very nice shift. And I'll look at it from the trading perspective because you know, originally having started out in cash equities and then Algo trading came in uh, and from the US and we brought it into Europe. I mean, you look at now, a lot of these tokens have a lack of liquidity on them. There's no real market making, but what do the market makers really want? When, and when you look to equities markets, you have the ETFs like the QQQs and the spiders. You, you had the futures products, the options, and then there was the underlying, which was an ARB opportunity or a hedge. So now, you know, what we're doing, uh, again, going into regulated jurisdictions, we're saying, all right, you might have a security token, all right, uh, we've created a set of futures contracts that mark to market against Ethereum as well. And then we're creating asset packages, whether it's then, uh, you know, not just, I mean, the US Bitcoin ETFs, I mean, effectively, it's just a CFD, right? But more diversified asset packages, because then a lot of these players want to come in they're already active, the likes of Jump Trading, Jane Street, XTX Markets, but that market's gonna go bigger, and then when you uh, interact that with institutional and retail flow, you've got a two-way market, and that's how we can grow some of these markets, and this is what we're really gonna see play out. So my last final question, are there any other questions out in the room? <coughs> because then I have my final question here. So we're talking about technology, we're talking about how to drive legislation into technology, and then we also almost represent all um, regions here in this uh, panel. So which region do you see will win this war? I mean, a lot of people are claiming that US right now, they are a little bit uh, on the side because they are dealing with the SEC and they're very tough. Then there are people claiming that, uh, okay, maybe Asia can do it, but again, it's also quite tough there. And, and then we have uh, Europe, which is, uh, I mean, it's Europe. We have. <laughs> Yeah, different uh, jurisdiction, everyone is battling Brexit, everything is coming up here. So, so who will win this war if we look into jurisdictions and uh, areas? I mean, being from the UK, I don't know if Europe is Europe anymore, I'm confused, but having said that, <laughs> but having said that, I mean, uh, you know, we're here, I mean, do we need a bystander or, or a real one? Otherwise, you know, I'll get told off by Jonathan at the back. <laughs> Obviously, it's Malta all the way, right? I mean, it's that one, but, but having said that, I mean, Malta has taken an early lead, but then you've got in July, as far as, far as um, security tokens are concerned, you get, you've got the EU prospectus regulation, prospectus directive, uh, and clarity around that coming out, actually. And, and of course, you've got different jurisdictions, like the French, the Germans, and others quite keen to come into this space. So I think Europe will be there. I mean, the US, I mean, the SEC are looking uh, at this. I mean, really, you're gonna go towards FINRA, broker, dealer, and ATS type status, as we've seen with other, other assets. We're invested into um, a CEF there, Swap Execution Facility, which uh, Bain are also invested into through Capital Ventures called CTX. 
And there, uh, you've got crypto to crypto or crypto to fiat uh, trading. So in the US, you've got this dual structure, CFTC, SEC. Um, but in, in Europe, I mean, most of these assets and the futures on them are going to fall in the MIFID 2 as well. And then, and then subsequently, maybe five years from now, MIFID, MIFID 3. Do you all agree in this statement? Do you think Europe it will be the winner? Maybe we could all it's, win it's, it's global, right? Because look, uh, we're, you know, one of the problems with institutions coming in is the same intermediary model that's broken now, right? They're trying to reintroduce. We don't want it, right? I mean, uh, th there's, there's an element of that. And now all these exchanges are going, it's going to be me, right? But think of it as the analog phone before the smartphone. All these liquidity pools can interconnect now, right? If you're trading crypto swaps, you can't fiat bank in one jurisdiction. You can affect a smart contract and other, and this is going to become a reality. Ten yeah. seconds. Yeah, this is not like gaming or where like one jurisdiction will win. If you look at the decentralized ledger technology and it powers money, it powers uh, capital markets, etc. Uh, there's nothing that in this technology that I see kind of you know hugely impacting who wins the money game or who wins capital markets. So I think the winners there are going to continue to be the winners. Yeah, and I, you know I I agree with George, which is that regions are dead, right? Like I'm I'm a you know, my, my fund is based in Japan, I'm based in Silicon Valley, and I'm here in Malta, right? And so to me, a region is super heterogeneous. So if you look at China, China is basically Bitcoin is dead, right? If you go to Korea, Bitcoin is doing well. If you go to Japan, Bitcoin is doing very well, right? So, you know, the regions are not heterogeneous. Singapore, it's a wonderful thing. You know, Singapore is trying really hard to be the Malta of Asia. So, you know, I think it's a very interesting uh, world. But to me, I think, you know, it's going to be domicile competition and it'll be trans-regional. So I think there's really, region, region is a historical artifact. This will be the final word. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, please give them a hand. And uh, I think the, <laughs> the basic conclusion here seems to be that uh, the winner will take it all. And uh, <laughs> we have this free competition. Thank That'll be much. the lawyers, right? Exactly. De <laughs> death and taxes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Checkpoint. Yep. So, well done to our wonderful panelists. It was a very entertaining discussion and very informative as well. Um, uh, one point which I would also like to add as well is that we're seeing an emerging phenomenon when it comes to, uh, let's say, secured tokens or financial instruments on the European Union. We are seeing the emergence of the so-called quasi-financial instruments. Those instruments which have elements um, that are very familiar or rather similar to financial instruments, but they're not classified as financial instruments in themselves. We've seen this trend emerging with regards to electronic money, e-money, the digital representation of fiat money. And thanks to stable coins, we've seen a clear example of quasi-e-money, whereby you have a token that is packed and also backed by fiat currency. It represents fiat currency, normally in one to one ratio. However, if you remove one of the fundamental criteria of e-money, such as the immediate right of redemption, or actually backing the token in a one to one basis, you no longer have e-money. You have something which exists outside the e-money framework. In the case of Maltese law, it would actually be classified as a virtual financial asset. And now, we're seeing the same thing happening with regards to financial instruments. Case in point, let's take the example of uh, derivative contracts that are settled in cryptocurrency. European law states very clearly that cryptocurrency derivatives, uh, sorry, derivative contracts should be settled in cash or physically. Physical settlement means actually getting the asset itself, whereas cash settlement has not been defined by any authority within the European Union. So what does it mean? Well, general practice dictates that cash settlement means that it need not be uh, settled in cash as legal tender, but it can be settled in any other kind um, uh, of asset whatsoever, as long as it conforms to general accounting standards. 
But there are other critics who state that cash settlement should be settlement solely in legal tender. So what, where does that leave us? Well, we've had a couple of supervisory authorities from some jurisdictions classifying such kind of contracts as financial instruments, whereas most of the others have remained silent on the matter. ESMA hasn't yet pronounced itself on this particular issue either. So what does it mean? Which way should we go? And therefore, this, of course, means that uh, some jurisdictions might potentially be a bit more adventurous and actually classify such kind of contracts as non-financial instruments, which would, of course, be a very interesting scene to witness. This is just the first case of uh, this kind of phenomenon taking place. And I'm very, very sure that um, in the near future, we'll see more of these instruments emerging. And of course, this will leave the regulators uh, scratching their heads as to how they should regulate such kind of instruments. More so importantly, we're seeing the emergence of decentralized finance. I was in consensus last week in uh, New York as well. And uh, the buzzword, at least for this year's consensus conference, was DeFi, decentralized finance. And we're seeing more of these models emerging, be it peer-to-peer -peer lending, be it peer-to-peer -peer asset um, trading through, the through tokenization. And this is all possible through blockchain technology. So how will the space continue evolving? Well, that is a question that, of course, um, we'll be answering all together in the years to come. Next up um, will be the Prime Minister's uh, keynote. Um, uh, I encourage you to um, uh, stay here for the next um, uh, few minutes. He will be here in the next five minutes or so. Um, uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, either relating to the first session, which of course um, related to um, the regulation of cryptocurrency exchanges, or to the second session, which of course related to ICOs versus STOs, please raise your hand, and I'm sure that either myself or Dr. E.F. Estacom will be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. So please um, um, bear with us, and uh, again, we'll be uh, with you quite shortly, um, uh, since the Prime Minister will be here in the next few minutes. By way of a quick round check, um, uh, how many of you here um, are, um, let's say, service providers um, in terms of, let's say, exchanges, brokers, custodians, so on? Okay. Um, how many of you here are legal, regulatory consultants? Quite a few. Um, how many of you, I guess, um, are from any kind of decentralized project, be it a cryptocurrency or not? One, two. Okay, and um, what's your, I guess, your take um, on the move that we're experiencing towards um, uh, regulation? Um, I don't have a 
take, but uh, I've got more of a question in a sense, perhaps from some of the people who are more um, you know, uh, experienced globally. And it follows on from the last question that we had, or the last point that was made at the last um, uh, sort of uh, talk, panel, I've forgotten. <laughs> Um, and that is that uh, I've, well, I'm, I'm looking, I've recently moved to Switzerland largely because there's a very, very strong uh, interaction between the regulators there and people are very comfortable with that regulatory body. Um, and also the regulators are a pr taking a very, um, quite a proactive approach, more so than perhaps say, I believe even British or the US ones. I'm not so familiar with the Maltese ones, but I'd be interested in a sort of global overview of people's comfort level with the regulatory authorities in all the different major jurisdictions? Of course, I would say that um, uh, the point of departure is that the regulatory authority needs to, of course, understand um, uh, how the industry works and how the industry is developing further. And this can only be done if the industry, is, uh, or the, rather the authority, is to first collect feedback from the industry and then regulate further. And I would say that Malta has done precisely that. Malta has, in fact, um, uh, listen to the industry first and then regulate it. However, all of this wouldn't have been possible. Malta couldn't have been a leading jurisdiction without a driving force in the driving seat. And in fact, whenever I am asked as to how we managed to, of course, succeed in this industry, my, question, my answer tends to be pretty simple. We've had an excellent driving force behind this regulated framework, and uh, this person is precisely our Prime Minister, Dr. Joseph Muscat, has been a believer in blockchain technology from the very start, and in fact, I would like to welcome the Prime Minister himself on stage here to deliver a keynote. I'm pretty sure he said that because he saw me coming in, so. No, thank you. I, I'd like just to take a couple of minutes to thank all the players involved in this industry. I think they're doing a great job as I already told the plenary downstairs, regulation defines rules which an authority should enforce and promote. And technology is guided by then the need, desire, and creati creativity, scientific exploration work that pushes the boundaries of the existing state of the art. The two are many times seen as pulling apart and in opposite directions. But really and truly, I think that the innovative part that we put together over here is that we are trying to see technology and regulation moving really and truly in the same direction. Last year, as you well know, we enacted a set of legislations that are aimed at providing both assurances while at the same time not being at the detriment of innovation. Most of the time in most <coughs> industries, I perceive the idea that regulation should be there to constrain and restrain innovation. We see it in a totally different perspective. We see regulation as a way in which to direct innovation and as a way in which to provide assurances within innovation and not as a sort of obstacle to more innovation. And this is true not only in this industry, but I think in so many different industries. And that is why Malta is being a success in all these areas, because the way in which we perceive Regulation is totally different from other areas. Actually, most of the time, people do think that players in different industries don't want to be regulated. My experience is that the opposite is true. Serious players want to be regulated because regulation provides assurances both for themselves, their prospective investors, and most importantly, their clients. And really and truly, this is where you um, differentiate between rogue players and the serious players in any industries. As I think you, you all know, our set of uh, rules and regulations have been put forward now and we're, we are now in at implementation stage. We are in a situation where in the future for new technology, which is used in safety critical or high risk applications, we should consider whether such technology arrangements should be mandatory, should require mandatory independent assessment and systems audit to raise the levels of ass assurances of such safety critical and high risk scenarios. I really believe this is the, the way forward and where, where we should go in the very, very near future. 
we should also aim to be a country that promotes innovation and does not hinder it. Whilst at the same time, we are being prudent to apply mandatory regulation where it is required. Finding this balance is, in my opinion, key. We have found a balance and will continue to find the right balance that benefits technology, society and our country as a whole. I think it's most conducive if I have a couple of minutes, I can take a couple of questions and then I'll leave you to, to the rest of the workshop. So anyone who wants to put forward a question, I'm ready to answer that. No one? That's great. If no <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. If you can identify yourself. Simple. Uh, will there be any regulation for banks? Well, that, that is, I think, the hundred billion dollar question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think we need to see it within the the wider the risking pressures that banks are having. I see legacy players uh, creeping very slowly in this area. Um, they will come at the end of the day. They will come to, to the same conclusion we have come to. But I think that the immediate solution are challenger banks. That is, I think, the only, the only real feasible way forward in the very near future. Um, obviously, um, these have to be nimble enough to uh, and resilient enough to withstand regulatory pressures. So I don't think that the solution is to ease regulatory pressure. The solution is really and truly having a business model that fits this industry rather than industry fitting the business model of banks. So that will eventually come but I think the low-hanging fruit is challenger banks, and that's where we're working um, uh, with our best resources right now. Sure. Prime Minister, this is <coughs> not a question, just a comment from personal experience. Thank you very much for everything you're doing for uh, the blockchain space and the Maltese economy as well. And I can only hope that you know uh, the elections will go favorably, and that we'll have to have your continued. I'm support. still prime minister on Monday. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Round of applause for Thank the Prime you. Minister of Malta. Thank you. So on we continue after that very inspiring keynote by the Prime Minister of Malta. Um, uh, next up, we have uh, yet um, uh, another very interesting uh, session. Again, we promise only one thing with regards to our workshop. You won't be bored, and I hope that you'll receive a lot of information that you'll find useful for your particular um, business case. So uh, um, uh, next up is, uh, can you guys update the next? Okay, things are not running on the blockchain, so I apologize for the slight delay. Perfect, thank you. Next up, I would like to welcome on stage a um, close friend of mine who actually back in uh, 2013, I had attended my first ever um, uh, course in relation to blockchain technology cryptocurrencies. Yes, there actually were some courses back then as well, although they were hard to come by. And uh, the person who actually delivered this course um, is uh, Mr. Adam Vaziri, um, the CEO of BlockPass who is a lawyer that has been long been involved in the space, in the crypto space, and certainly is one of the very um, uh, best regarded um, names in the industry whenever it comes to regulation and compliance. I will let Adam explain further about his platform, but all those um, AML junkies would like to, of course, know more about how this uh, space being regulated 
or rather catered for from a technology perspective and related to ML and KYC, make sure we're still here for this session. Round of applause for Mr. Adam Vaziri. Thanks, John. Uh, great, uh, great to be here. Malta is so fantastic, loving the innovation. Um, so my background is as a lawyer, but I started in 2013 and there weren't many people um, working in this space at the time. Um, what fascinated me was discovering Bitcoin and the power of peer-to-peer -peer financial transactions, the ability of a decentralized framework for finance. And at that point, you know, in 2012, I decided I would pretty much dedicate my career to that. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time working with companies that were setting up Bitcoin exchanges or peer-to-peer -peer payment systems and trying to bring them into the mainstream of finance. So what does that mean? Mainstream of finance, as you know, is a regulated industry um, for the most part. Same is true with gambling. There are other industries too. And blockchain and crypto intersects with those regulated industries. So if you want to see, for example, some of the edge players that were not regulated enter into the mainstream of finance, they too need to be regulated. So I was helping a lot of those businesses enter into that and get licenses to operate their business. I helped get the first payments license using Bitcoin instead of SWIFT for payments, the first derivatives exchange based on Bitcoin licensed by the FCA, and the first lottery on Ethereum that was licensed uh, in um, the Isle of Man. But what I found was the, the problem is um, that you spend a lot of your time as a consultant pe telling people what not to do, and it becomes repetitive. Um, so for about two years ago, I decided rather than telling people what not to do, I would build technology to assist them so they wouldn't even need to think about what not to do. It would be somewhat like driving a car. You don't necessarily know how the engine works, but you just drive the car comfortably and expect that everything functions um, properly. Um, and the same is true with regulations. Uh, I don't believe that people should understand the intricacies of regulations. They should just be able to drive their business, drive their car. And so that's what regulatory technology is. It's the engine underneath the hood that no one should really know about, but that it works adequately um, so that you are safe. Um, okay, I'm not sure how the slides work. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so what I'm gonna give you is a little bit of an overview about what I see to be some of the em emerging trends and how, um, you know, what are the risks essentially, just outlining what those risks are and how can we address those risks from potentially a technical point of view. So a couple of things that I'm gonna look into is some of the major risks that seem to be a perennial issue within crypto and that is hacking. Um, and what are those technical measures possible to address some of that hacking risk? Um, and then we look at a related issue, which is the protection of client funds. So protection of client funds for any financial regulated industry is like the utmost of utmost importance. So adhering to that obligation um, may present a challenge for um, exchanges. So thinking about what are the technical tools to, to mitigate that? And then looking at the trend uh, which we see today, which is an increase of regulations within crypto. You know, when I started in 2013, FinCEN was practically the only reg um, regulator that had provided official guidance on how companies would be regulated. Now, um, there are many countries that are creating their own national uh, policies in this area. And so with the increase of regulation, we need a way of mitigating that for, uh, from a business point of view, and as I said, through reg tech. And then we'll look at you know, the ICO, IEO craze, and how an increase of regulations will impact that, and what's necessary to allow the fluidity that the ICOs provide, but also some safety around it. And then one of the final points would be looking at DeFi, which is more thinking of thinking really what the, the, the Nakamoto mission was, which was decentralized finance, and how we can make that sustainable. So if you look at hacking at the moment, you see 
roughly on average a billion dollars goes missing a year. Um, 2018, um, a billion dollars lost. Uh, that's quite a lot of money, and it's client funds. So why is this happening? Is it the fact that exchanges um, ordinarily are incompetent? Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, the reason is, and it's a quite a simple one, um, cryptocurrencies are digital bearer assets. A bearer asset is an asset that if you control physically, that you are the de facto owner. If you control the private key of a cryptocurrency, then you are the owner, you are the controller. And interestingly, um, financial instruments that were bearer assets were always in a physical form. So you'd have bearer bonds in paper. And so if you break into someone's safe and steal the bearer bonds, then you'll be the owner. But when you combine that with a digital environment, which is remote and global, then the rewards of hacking are much greater because all you need to do is break in and steal the keys and then you have de facto control. So the return on investment for hackers is um, unusually high uh, because remotely they can organize their crime and conduct a theft which is effectively irreversible. So that's the challenge that is presented to exchanges. It's not that they are incompetent, by no means. Some of them, of course, are. But it is that the asset that they are dealing with is both digital and bearer in nature, which presents an inherent security issue. So how do we deal with these um, losses? A billion dollars gets lost every year of client funds. So some of the measures um, um, are technical um, that have been, been presented, but they are controversial. So for example, after the DAO hack, which was a, an, an attempt to create a decentralized fund, um, the Ethereum project decided that the way of resolving this, which where $50 million was stolen from the smart contract, was to um, effectively change the blockchain itself. So fork the blockchain, at that time Ethereum, so that the incident never occurred and that people would be restored to the position they were before. Obviously, uh, this led to quite a lot of controversy within Ethereum and it led effectively to Ethereum Classic. Ethereum Classic were people proponents of this notion that blockchain should never change. And therefore, um, it was an anathema for the Ethereum project to try and resolve what was a private matter. And just recently, Binance, they, they lost um, quite a significant amount of money. Um, and it was interesting to see that on Twitter, um, CZ was talking about having discussed a potential rollback of the Bitcoin blockchain to see if um, they could address the, the hack that occurred. But really, in reality, um, rollbacks are not feasible options for public blockchains. So we're not going to necessarily remedy the in hacking that's occurring with exchanges by presenting that as an option. Um, that said, certain blockchains, for example, EOS, or what they are attempting to do, um, through the notion of public arbitration, um, they potentially may be able to introduce this as um, a kind of arbitration procedure um, that can be effected on chain. Um, I'm not sure if EOS themselves would be successful, but maybe a, um, a fork of EOS, Telos, which are trying to do this. So we may find that there may be technical measures to address the inherent uh, insecurity of digital bearer assets. So what is the mitigation? Well, the mitigation today, unfortunately, is simply coordination. So exchanges and law enforcement coordinating together to effect some form of restitution. Um, but a strange, uh, you know, a an aspect of this is that the analytics tools, so the tools that law enforcement use, are not necessarily fit for purpose. Because, as an example, 
500 million dollars was stolen from uh, CoinCheck, but it was stolen in the NEM cryptocurrency. And there is no um, commercial tool for the analysis, forensic analysis of the NEM blockchain. So where you have a hacking occurring in Bitcoin, then there is chain analysis and many others that can support law enforcement. But when it occurs in a fairly obscure cryptocurrency, then there are no technical tools to support it. But there is another mitigating factor. And I would call that um, the public transparency or the public forum aspect of um, crimes that occur on chain. So a hacking attempt is what I would classify as on-chain crime. Because as soon as the hack occurs, the address is notified effectively to the community, and the community can track that address and what is happening um, essentially to those, the proceeds of crime. And it's for public view. Now, if you are an organized criminal and you affect a bank heist, um, you do not want everyone to be surveying you uh, thereafter. And you know, the, the key thing is, is to make off with your winning, so to speak, and disappear into the sunset. But when, it, when the crime occurs on chain, that's not necessarily possible because everyone is observing your every move. So money laundering thereafter is actually a challenging task for some of these uh, on-chain criminals. Um, so let's look at some of those incidents. So Bitstamp hack, which was one of the most interesting early hacks from a kind of on-chain crime perspective. Um, when the hack occurred, with things over 10,000 Bitcoin stolen, um, you had a community of people on Reddit that were following what the hacker was doing with the funds, where they were sending the funds, and where they were going to. Um, this is almost like community law enforcement, um, which is very interesting, and this phenomenon has never existed. Um, so there is some mitigation. Let's look at another one. So the recent one, which was Binance. So this is the address of the hacker. Um, the $50 million stolen. Anyone can go and visit that address and track where the money is going. And uh, this one is the Cryptopia hack, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. Um, again, the address is available on Etherscan, and you can just every now and again, if, it's, if you so wish, you can observe where the money is going. Um, that level of transparency has never existed. So I believe uh, that that is certainly a mitigating factor. Okay, so what are the implications of it? Um, when we think about client funds um, and digital bearer assets, it is a challenge for those exchanges to protect client funds. Although they may have the operational measures in place, they are not necessarily immune from hacking. And I think most exchanges just bear the reality that at some stage their systems will be breached and that they are just getting ready for that event to occur. However, there are technical controls that can be used to harden at least the security of some crypto assets. And uh, these really apply to tokens. Um, so any asset that is created on a main chain. So Bitcoin, you can't really do anything about it. It's a digital bearer asset. But an asset that is issued on a main chain, you may be able to affect certain technical controls. On Ethereum, they have the smart contract ability. So you may be able to introduce a technical control to protect that asset from hacking. And so those two categories of technical controls are whitelisting and freeze function. So I would like to give you a demonstration of how this has worked in practice from my own personal experience. Um, I am the CEO of BlockPass. We have a token called the Pass token. And when we built this token, we embedded within it um, identification. So anyone that has the token must get identified before they are able to transfer the token. That's because the product itself um, is an identity product. Our, our token is an identity product. 
But the byproduct of this design was to harden the security properties of that token. So I'm going to give you an example. So this is uh, Cryptopia. Cryptopia were hacked, um, and Pass Token was one of the assets within uh, Cryptopia. And this is the address of the hacker. And you can see here uh, in red, this is uh, from Etherscan, showing an exclamation mark. It says, error in transaction, reverted. So the hacker, um, he stole, I think, about $70 million of Ether and other tokens, um, held the funds, and then started gradually transferring them out. But un unsuccessfully, um, he was able to transfer past tokens. He was not able to transfer past tokens. He tried 58 days ago to transfer past tokens. He tried even 23 days ago to transfer past tokens, but he cannot because he needs to get identified <laughs> before he can transfer them. And obviously, logically, the, tra the hacker is not going to approach us and send us his passport, disclose his identity for us to whitelist his tokens. So this is a technical control that can be introduced in practice to harden the security properties of tokens. So what is um, you know, the, the, the implication of this? These technical controls, you may not see them in typical cryptocurrencies, but I presume that you will see them more in other utilities tokens. Um, another to control that I mentioned was the freeze function. So if someone hacks your token in an exchange, and there are many that are affected by the hacking attempts, you can affect a freeze of the smart contract, which means that the hacker is unable to transfer any further tokens. And then you can go through a, um, a restitution process for those people that have ha now had their assets frozen. So what is interesting is although most the trend is towards digital bearer assets, we are seeing the trend with security tokens to have this inherent technical security within it. Um, so all security tokens have some form of whitelisting, just like our pass token. And this thereby increases the security of those assets. So it's not, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say it's not going to be unusual to see less security hacking att attempts involving security tokens. So we can assume that that industry itself will have better inherent security properties. Okay, so that concludes the kind of, um, you know, what you can and can't do in relation to cryptocurrencies and addressing the hacking attempts. But what we're now going to look at is the increase of regulation. 2019, for me, heralds a new wave of regulation in crypto. Uh, we're seeing, for example, FinCEN um, and FATF um, get much more involved uh, in this industry. FATF publishes guidelines um, on anti-money laundering. If you went, they are at the apex of AML policy. And once they publish their guidelines, they trickle down to regional and national regulators for implementation. FATF have said quite categorically now that all cryptocurrency service um, providers need to be registered or licensed. So the result of that is there will be somewhat of a delay between them issuing their guidelines and national regulators responding, but we can assume within two to three years that most operators around the world will be licensed or registered. FinCEN, um, who's been tracking the space um, for at least you know, eight years, have published a very comprehensive guideline where they have classified ICOs as requiring FinCEN registration, crypto casinos as well, and even on-chain anonymizers. So these are services provided on-chain to anonymize your Bitcoins. They classify that service in of itself as a money service business. 
And if you do not register, then that's a federal crime. And it's enforced um, you know, outside of the territory of the United States, as you may be aware of. But, you know, when you see regulations, I think about costs. So how do you mitigate the cost implication of new regulations? Well, that's when regulatory technology comes in. And analytics tools, such as chain analysis, et cetera, but more versatility is needed. You know, we need to have analytics tools that can address a hacking attempt involving NEM cryptocurrency to the tune of half a billion dollars. Um, so those tools need to be much more versatile. They need to be less concentrated on one particular cryptocurrency, but looking broadly at how the technology is morphing and changing. And then identity tools. For me, AML KYC is a problem that can be fixed with technology. It's just that no one has had the volition to put in effect some technology to address that. Um, so when we rethink regulations, we need to think of technology first. And so for us at BlockPass, our aim is essentially to eliminate that friction entirely so that merchants don't need to even think about KYC. They can simply connect to an API and receive data from users that is already pre-verified to an international standard of AML and KYC. By having a system like that, me as the merchant, I don't need to worry about KYC. For me, the barrier of regulation, once I've addressed that, is not so demoralizing because I can still concentrate on my business and just simply integrate an API to get verified profile. And from our point of view, the way that we have designed the system is as, it is as a shared infrastructure. So where KYC is done by every single merchant, if you sign up with five merchants, they have to verify you five times. With BlockPass, you are verified once, but you share your verified profile five times with one click. The result of that is it becomes shared infrastructure, which reduces the overall cost for everyone in the ecosystem. So I would argue that the increase of regulation, if addressed with regulatory technology and very targeted technology, will not have a financial impact um, on new businesses that it will be regulated. So this is just an, this is essentially our app. You download the app, you get verified, all of the data is stored within your telephone, and then you can share your verified profile with any merchant in one click. One click onboarding experience. For the merchant, um, you know, you're looking at five minutes for onboarding, and that's the app. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the use case around I ICOs. So ICOs raised roughly about $20 billion um, in uh, 2018. But the biggest ICO, which is EOS, uh, did this without even an iota of KYC. Obviously, that's no longer possible because of the FinCEN guidelines, which says that ev every ICO will need to be registered. Um, and that it has obviously some extra territorial effect, US regulations. So all ICOs will need to uh, consider KYC. Here in Malta, they regulate virtual financial assets, which means inherently KYC is going to be needed if you sell them. But as I said, regulatory technology is needed to address the pain of KYC. And it is a pain. It's a pain for everyone. So with a system like BlockPass, you have reusable um, KYC. So we expect with that type of technology, people will still be able to enjoy participating in a global ICO with one click and not worry about the KYC factor. And for the issuer of the token, they're thinking, oh, it's too much friction KYC and it's too much time KYC. But with this type of technology, they can still have a frictionless experience, um, but at the same time comply. Obviously, for STOs, it's a little bit different because KYC is a given. Um, but for them, if they introduce layers and layers of friction, then they'll be reverting back to the kind of legacy of private placement, etc. So they'll need fast technology to address that, address that. And it's all feasible today. So the last thing I want to talk about is 
the DeFi context, so decentralized finance, which essentially is the epitome of the Bitcoin project. You know, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is, obviously not Craig Wright, um, his vision was decentralized finance. He said, we're going to create a decentralized payment system without a central administrator. Everyone in the system can participate in its upkeep. That is DeFi. And what you are seeing today is basically the, the, the vision that uh, that, uh, that project um, you know, uh, encapsulated being actually materialized in practice. So with smart contract technology, you can pretty much build any type of application. And what we are aiming towards is a kind of permissionless, frictionless, intermediary-less financial services industry. But I would argue that these new markets that are being created need more optionality. So if I want to interact with a decentralized exchange and trade on that decentralized exchange, I don't necessarily want to trade with everyone. I may want to only trade with people that are not on a sanctions list, for example. If I am interacting with other people on a forum, I may want to um, ensure that those people are accredited investors before I present to them a potential investment opportunity. And if I am providing content on a website, I may want to know that those people are over the age of 18 years old. Um, so this is kind of where I see the next phase um, of technology. So we have built another product, which is Pass Verify and mentioned the token. The token is a decentralized, anonymous identity verification system. So it means once you have been identified as a result of having the token in your wallet, we do not retain your data, it's deleted. But your address on chain is now a verified address, meaning that other decentralized applications can interact with verified people. We don't know block pass who those people are, but we have verified them. And so the same is true with other features that we will add where someone will come, prove that they're over 18, we will then color their address by saying, this address on chain is someone that is over the age of 18. People will come to us, prove that they're an accredited investor, we will then color their address on chain and say that they are accredited investors. And they can prove to you by simply proving that they control the key behind that address. And that is just basic cryptography. And for those that you know, worry about um, authentication, for example, for websites, they have a distributed ledger. So it's irrefutable proof that I am in control of that key. So our imagination within BlockPass is to take DeFi to the next level by introducing DREGs, so regulatory frameworks <coughs> embedded on chain that allow for compliant decentralized applications. Yeah, and so one of the partnerships I would like to mention um, is the partnership we have with Waves blockchain. Uh, Waves is a fantastic smart contract based blockchain. Um, they have engaged us to introduce the pass verify system on the Waves blockchain so that decentralized applications on Waves can benefit um, from the inherent security of a DREG system such as pass token. And that's all I have to talk about, really. I can't click to conclusion, so I don't have a conclusion. <laughs> Apart from just to say, cryptocurrencies seem a little bit scary. That's because they're bearer digital assets. There is nothing that we can do to fix that inherently for those particular cryptocurrencies. Of course, we mentioned the rollback, but those are very controversial and pretty much infeasible options. That said, we will see blockchains that will have kind of arbitration systems, such as EOS, where some technical control within the blockchain may be able to address hacking attempts. That said, we are also seeing a trend in layer two assets 
such as utility tokens, including pass token and others, which will have security properties within them. So in the event of a hacking attempt, there is some measure available to protect the assets. But what we need to see is more versatile analytics tools. We need to see the introduction of better regulatory technology so that the increase of regulations that will be occurring now does not have an impact on innovators within the industry. And at the same time, our decentralized financial system that we envisage needs to have decentralized regulatory systems to support it. And that's what we're trying to do um, in Block Pass. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, that's a great um, observation. You know, everyone is sitting there eating popcorn, as you so rightly say, watching where you're moving the money. Um, I, I think, you know, maybe earlier on, maybe 2013, 14, there obviously there was less regulation. There were some exchanges that would not even conduct any analytics on receiving uh, funds. So it was a little bit easier, even though it, you were in the public's purview, people weren't really following you. Um, so there was less awareness. Now there is more awareness, and there is more coordination across law enforcement, Interpol, Europol, that are very well versed to coordinate across all of these exchanges. But the fraudsters, bear in mind that the ROI, as I explained, is very high from the point of view of hacking, because they create a script um, that can take a matter of a few days, deploy the script, and target exchanges, but also wallets. Wallets are very much a target. For example, any type of hosted wallet, um, blockchain.info, um, they are a target for hackers. They'll use something like Punicode. Punicode is um, taking the Latin alphabet and using the Russian alphabet. It looks like the Latin alphabet, but it's different. Um, and so they click on it, they think it's the genuine website, they go through authentication and steal the funds. Um, that's a little bit easier to run off with your money than a kind of very public exchange hacking because those incidents are ne necessarily publicly reported. So the ROI is still very high. Um, regarding this transparency aspect, I think it will start to have an impact um, when um, people see that law enforcement are managed to affect restitution for those people that lost the funds. Um, that restitution process is very long-winded. It can take a few years to bring people back to the position they were before. When they see, okay, you know, ten out, you know, uh, eight out of ten hacks results in restitution at the end of 90% of the funds, then those fraudsters won't necessarily be hacking exchanges. They'll go for the wallets instead. Um, but it, I'm saying it's a mitigation factor. I don't know necessarily what the impact will be in practice. Also, bear in mind that anonymizers and other technologies will be far more advanced. And if you have interchain protocols, so moving from one protocol to another, you may have anonymizers on other chains that can you know, anonymize the funds and bring it out into another chain. So the layering aspects will become more advanced as well. So I mentioned it, you're in public purview, but I don't necessarily know what the impact will be in the long run. Yeah, eventually, when you have like a, an interchain protocol such as Cosmos and what they're doing at Polkadot, etc., then you may be able to shift into other blockchains, pr um, layer as much as you can, anonymize as much as you can, and then come back out the other end on another blockchain. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, sure. So 
So Block Pass is an application. You download it on your telephone. You then add your data into the, the application. You then said submit your data for verification to us. It hits our servers. We then verify the data. Once the verification has occurred, we generate digital certificates for you that are cryptographically signed. And then we delete all of the data from wherever we process it. Now, you have on your device your profile in your phone memory with um, the digital certificates. You can then connect in the identity network to any merchant. When you've made that connection, you can send through an encrypted channel um, your data to that merchant. They receive the data on their servers. BlockPass has got nothing to do with it. The only thing that we provide to the merchant is the proof that the user has not changed the data. And we just do that through cryptographic hashing mechanisms. Yeah, so the merchant can collect as much data from the user as it so wishes. We have some merchants that collect 20 points of data from the user as well as the digital certificates. So it's not dissimilar to any normal onboarding. Um, it's just that they are pre-verified as well. So you can collect the passport's name, you know, all of that stuff, plus the digital certificates to say that they've already been verified. So it's like pre-outsourcing verification. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. So, so far we've mostly been uh, talking, I guess, um, um, at the top layer, regulators, the law. We, of course, have you present as the industry, as the middle layer. However, we've seen that in the past, on various numerous occasions, a top-down approach hasn't led the desired results and that nowadays we're moving towards a bottom-up approach. And what can we do to drive the most important layer? I would say that the answer to that is education. Education is key to ensuring that we all move at the same rapid pace and we're all on the same page. And I would say that out of the numerous projects out there, the one which is definitely in the top echelon of providing um, uh, education as well as actually providing structure with regards to uh, this new industry is the Cardano platform. The Cardano platform which is underpinned by the Cardano Foundation, IOHK and Emergo. And I would like to welcome on stage Dr. Lars Brunius who is the head of education at Cardano. Warm round of applause for Lars, thank you. My wife and I um, signed a deed for an apartment here that we bought because we like it so much. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife says I start all my talks with hello everybody and sound very German and like a bad imitation of Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I skipped that today and um, start <laughs> Introducing myself, so as Jonathan already said, I'm the director of education of IOHK. I'll say a bit more about IOHK in a minute. And um, so I'm a mathematician by training. I love mathematics. I like, uh, I love coding. Uh, I'm German, as you undoubtedly can hear. And uh, spent some time at Cambridge University for my postdoc, spent many years uh, teaching and doing research at university and then joined IOHK in 2016. Uh, first as a Haskell developer and then later joining the education department and am director of education. And I don't know about you, but when I hear that somebody is a director or manager of something, then I think he probably doesn't do much of that something and just has people that do the something. I'm happy to announce that it's different for me, so um, this is a picture of me um, at the graduation ceremony for our Haskell course in Ethiopia. 
Um, I spent three months there at the beginning of this year, from January to March, teaching 22 young ladies, Ethiopians and Ugandans, Haskell. So I'm very much involved and um, do get my hands dirty in what we do. And I want to use my talk to, to tell a bit more about how I ended up in Ethiopia and uh, why we do what we do and why we think it's very important. So only the educated are free. So I believe education is very important. And let me start by introducing my company, IOHK, that Jonathan already mentioned. So our motto is providing financial services to the three billion people that don't have them. And um, how do we do that? So we see ourselves as a factory for blockchain technology. So um, Jonathan mentioned Cardano Foundation, Emergo, and IOHK. So the Cardano Foundation is the public-facing part, uh, community work and so on. Emergo is for commercialization and IOHK is the actual engineering company that provides the software. And it was founded in 2015, so relatively young, by Charles Hoskinson and Jeremy Wood. Maybe some of you knew Charles from uh, as being the first CEO of Ethereum, one of the founders of Ethereum. And uh, after leaving Ethereum, he founded IOHK, uh, trying to do it better. And um, so we are the company behind Cardano. Cardano is one of the top 10 cryptocurrencies. But as I mentioned, so factory for um, blockchain technology. So we are much more than just a cryptocurrency. So, um, and we are a very distributed company. I think we have people in 20 countries. So it's almost all time zones. And um, we are heavily invested in functional programming. So for those of you that don't know what that means, it's, it's not mainstream, it's not like Java or C Sharp, .NET, Python. It's more mathematical, more um, structured, and easier to analyze. And we believe it's the right thing to, the right technology to um, take mathematical protocols that are highly security sensitive and faithfully translate them into a working product. And um, what distinguishes us from most or all of our competitors is that we take the science extremely seriously. So instead of just writing white papers that basically everybody can write unfiltered, uh, we heavily bet on uh, peer-reviewed research. So we work with universities all over the world. We have a lab at Edinburgh University and another at Tokyo Tech and collaborations with also um, many other universities, for example, Urbana-Champaign in the US. And um, so a large portion of our employees is actually scientists that work at universities, teach at universities. So we, um, the papers we produce uh, undergo all the usual rigid standards uh, of academia, so in particular peer review. And we I think we have around 40 papers published by now that all went through this rigorous process because we believe it's very important to, to apply the strictest um, possible um, scrutiny to, to, to the protocols that will actually run eventually in our products and then, um, I mean, be responsible for, for billions of dollars. So it's important to, to get the science right. And then, of course, also the engineering. And I should mention, especially in light of the education part, that that we don't have any patents, so we believe in open source. Everything we do, including the education material we produce, is open source. Because even though we think we are wonderful, we also believe that we can't do everything by ourselves. So we share everything, all our results uh, with the world and think that if we fail at some point, then hopefully somebody else can take it up and, and uh, continue. So, blockchain adoption, one of the um, biggest topics, I believe. So, um, it's all very well if, if some people are able to get rich and buy Lamborghinis. But, I mean, for, for cryptocurrencies to really be relevant and change the world, what we need is, is adoption, is mass adoption. And um, so that it's not longer used just for speculation, but actually useful. So, it's important that you can actually do something um, with the cryptocurrencies and with the technology for it to, to really take off and change the world. 
And this is in particular a big, a huge chance for developing countries. Um, I mean, I always say I'm German and of course it's very nice to have decentralized banking, but I'm pretty happy with my banks in Germany. So, I mean, I can, I'm relatively sure that my money is safe and I can use my bank cards to pay and so on. But um, in the develop developing world, it looks different. And um, this picture shows an African woman with a cell phone to remind us that um, some decades ago, I mean, in Africa, there were villages with maybe one phone that the whole population could use and share. And then when cell phones came along, uh, Africa basically jumped. And at some point in time, there were more cell phones in Africa than in the uh, rest of the world combined. So instead of trying to catch up and building the infrastructure, phone lines and so on, uh, in Africa, people basically jumped over that step and immediately switched to cell phones um, for their communication. And of course, the hope is that the same can happen in the finance and banking sector. So instead of building up a traditional banking infrastructure by adopting blockchain, uh, developing countries will be able to, to jump over that step and, and catch up much more quickly. And um, also, of course, with developing countries, I mean, they, they um, have made very bad experiences in the past, so they're extremely skeptical of people from Europe or the US coming to their country and telling them we can solve all your problems. So one has to be very sensitive and very careful there. And on the other hand, of course, the people in those countries know best what their problems are and how to solve them. So um, one of my students there, she immediately from Uganda, actually, so most of the ladies are Ethiopians, but we had also four Ugandan students. So um, one of them told the story that in Uganda, often if you buy a piece of land, you have to pay for it three times. So you buy it and then somebody comes along and says, no, we don't have any records of your purchase. and please pay again and that so we pay again so we have paid a second time and then somebody else comes and no sorry no records so you have to pay again and that seems to be a huge problem in Uganda and probably also in other African countries so sh she was very passionate about um, taking the things she learned from us and applying it to land registry um, other students worried about healthcare or um, coffee supply chain things like that Right, so taking that into account that we have to be sensible how we approach developing countries, I mean not being arrogant, um, listening to the people. So the approach that IOHK takes in, in entering a new market, entering a new country is via education. So before we try to sell anything or make any deals, we, we offer a course. So we go there physically. I mentioned three months this year in Ethiopia and, and do a very intense course. So we pay for that. We even pay the students because often they have to quit their job to in, in order to, be, to attend. So they obviously have to live. And um, Right, so, so before we demand anything or, or negotiate anything, we, we start with education. And um, we try to do that on a very high level, so we normally try to um, do a cooperation with governments and universities, and then we ask them, give us our best and brightest, and we teach them Haskell and other things. And of course, while teaching, it's always a dialogue, so as I mentioned, the ladies before with the land grab. Um, so while teaching, of course, we, we talk to them and, and talk about their problems, listen to them, learn from them as well. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, the people that successfully graduate, we normally offer them a job. So, um, and because, as I mentioned, we are a distributed company, um, it's also nice. So, I mean, a lot of countries have the problem, this brain drain that the best and brightest leave for the US or for Europe. So, in our case, they can stay where they are, um, work for us, and work on problems that are close to their hearts. So, it's a win-win for everybody because we have the local expertise, 
and uh, we good, uh, get good employees and uh, the country benefits because somebody is working on their problems and also um, they don't leave, so they are there in the community and can inspire others. So let me go a bit into detail what we actually teach in these courses. So the quote, if women are expected to do the same work as men, we must teach them the same things as you noticed on the picture. So this Ethiopia course was only female students. So um, what we do, we have done that three times now, um, is roughly eight weeks of Haskell. I'll talk about Haskell a bit more in a second. And um, it's, it's a very intense course, so we start at the very basics. In principle, all you, I mean, we normally take university graduates as students, but in principle, all you need is, is like an analytical, mathematical mind, um, because Haskell is quite different to other languages, so having like lots of experience or uh, having had courses at university normally don't give you much of an advantage. And uh, it's a mixture, so it's uh, lectures, assignments, projects. It's a full-time course, so five days a week, 10 weeks, actually 12 weeks now in Ethiopia. So we try to mix um, theory and practice. And that was incidentally also in Ethiopia quite interesting. So uh, the, it seems the education there leans more on the theoretical side. So the students did fine uh, with the lectures until we did our first assignments and then with the first assignment it was quite horrible, the result. And so we noticed that, um, I mean, understanding something and actually being able to sit at the computer and, and code a solution is two different things. So then we switched and did much more examples and sat down with every student and answered their questions and worked with them. So uh, this mixture is very important to, to mix the theory with actually working on projects. And um, so, of course, we try to, because we are a blockchain company, wherever possible, we try to use examples from the blockchain domain. So one of the projects that's very um, popular amongst the students in all the courses I've done so far is actually writing a peer-to-peer -peer client. And then it's fun because they have different groups and then if it's successful, the, the solutions of the different groups can actually discover each other and talk to each other. So the students always love that. And um, so originally it was an eight weeks course, just Haskell, but now recently IOHK announced uh, our um, smart contract languages, Plutus and Malo. So at this particular course in, in Ethiopia, we also tagged on two weeks uh, where we taught that. So um, let me talk a little bit about Haskell. So I mean, there are always people that demand that uh, education, university, uh, is too theoretical and should be um, should prepare people better for the for the market and and for actually working at companies. So um, people criticize that students waste their time learning stuff like whatever history, philosophy. I personally think that's a very bad idea. I think uh, education, general education, is important, and I think that if we would emphasize that more, we maybe would have less problems now with right-wing populism in Europe and the US. So I think, for example, history is very important. Well, Haskell is of course not history, but at least it's quite general. So uh, Haskell is not only used by IOHK, it's a 30-year-old it's a language, and um, it's not mainstream, so it was first created by a committee, which is normally a bad sign, but in this case it worked out very well. And um, it's a so-called functional language, I mentioned that before, which means it's very mathematical, very structured, and it actually, learning Haskell forces you to, to approach problems in a, in a different way and have a different look at, at problems. So I always say that even if somebody does the course and then doesn't end up working for us and just ends up working for um, in another mainstream language like Java or Python, it's still worth it because even uh, for normal software developers, having learned Haskell gives you a totally new perspective on, on problem solving. So in that sense, it's a very general thing. It just so happens that at IHK, we Haskell is basically our main language. So um, of course, it's useful if you end up working for IHK learning Haskell, but its use is far beyond that. Um, this might be a bit technical, but let me talk a little bit about it. So it's purely functional and lazy. 
functional basically means that things behave more in method like mathematics than in other languages. Lazy means um, basically Haskell only does work if the result is needed. So if you never look at the result, it's not even computed. Which is very important is this explicit effects. So maybe just briefly in, in a normal language like Java, if you have a function that takes a number and returns a number, then if you call that function twice with the same number with three, it might happen that once you get five and then you get seven because the function can do something like um, go on the network and Google something, for example, and you don't see that. But in Haskell, it's not like that. So if you have a Haskell function from taking a number, returning a number, and you are guaranteed that each time you put in seven uh, or three, you get out five. And that, of course, uh, that makes it easier to analyze it. And being able to analyze it is important, especially for us, for cryptocurrencies, because you want to prove properties of your programs that, for example, nobody can steal your money. Right, so it's not mainstream. So that's what I mentioned before. It's actually um, basically all the students start on a clean slate because um, most people haven't learned it at university, have never heard of it. So, so it's something new, but uh, it also gains popularity, has gained popularity over the last years because it has certain advantages. For example, for if you have multi-processor machines, Haskell programs are somehow behave nicer than other uh, programs written in other languages. So it is more popular now than it was five years ago, but it's still not mainstream. And it's especially popular in financial institutions. So a lot of banks like Standard Chartered in the UK use Haskell. But also companies like Facebook. Facebook uses Haskell for uh, spam detection. Right, and then as I mentioned for the Ethiopia course, the first time this year we tagged on two weeks of Plutus and Malo. So Plutus is our smart contract language for the Cardano network. And it's actually very similar to Haskell, and it's also implemented in Haskell. So the idea is that you have a smooth experience um, between on-chain and off-chain code. So of course, there's the hurdle that you have to learn Haskell, but once you know Haskell, um, you basically everything is, is like uniform. If you do more conventional things like Solidity on Ethereum, you always have the problem that the on-chain code is written in one language, Solidity, and the off-chain code is normally JavaScript. And then there's always this um, problem of, of translating back and forth. And you have two different languages and that uh, always causes problems. So we have this different approach that everything is Haskell, basically. And um, finally, Malo is on top of Plutus. That's a so-called DSL, uh, domain-specific language for financial contracts. So it's not as powerful as a normal programming language. It only can do one thing namely financial contracts, but those things it can do very well. Um, and it has this advantage that you don't need to be a Haskell programmer, not even a software developer. So our hope is that um, people like finance experts um, can actually use that language to, to formulate financial contracts. Right, so that's the curriculum that we teach. And let me briefly go over the courses we did. So we started in 2017 in Athens, Greece, obviously not a developing country, but we just wanted to try this course, how it works. So we started small with seven students and that was successful. So we hired almost all of them, I think, yes, except one. Then last year, uh, January to March, I was on Barbados for two and a half months. Um, so that was a bit bigger and was a developing country, but it was still not the real deal because most of the students, half of the students were actually IOHK employees that just didn't know Haskell. But um, there were some external ones and we also hired them. And then basically the greatest success so far and also for me very emotional and very um, heartwarming was this course in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia now. So as I mentioned, all female students was incidentally um, the African summit was meeting in Addis Ababa last year and uh, one of the things on their agenda was um, um, how, to, how to help women. And uh, so it was important for the Ethiopian government that we do this. And uh, we have gotten some criticism for that, that we did this all female course, but I think it was a great idea and it worked out really well. And if you look at the previous slides, I mean, 
that was open for everybody, but of course only men joined. So I think that was a nice balance now to, to, to have this course only for women. 22 Ethiopians, four from Uganda, and um, we are right, uh, right now in the process of hiring all of them. So some are already on board, and but it's still um, going on. And um, last week I was in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, so that's the next country we want to enter. And um, we did a hackathon there, and we also had some fun on camels. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's also important for us. I mean, we feel that it's not enough if you enter a country to just sit in boardrooms and, and talk to people in suits. You must also experience a country and try to somehow understand the culture and to, to get a feeling for it. Right, so we did a hackathon there on Malo, the financial contract language I mentioned before, which was very successful, 66 participants that had a lot of fun. And we also talked about doing the next Haskell course, this next three-month Haskell course in Mongolia. So probably end of this year or beginning of next year, I spent a lot of time in Mongolia, which is very cold at that time, I'm told. So let's see. And um, so the impact of what we've done, so it, that's our strategy, how we enter a country, and it's actually been extremely successful. So in uh, Addis Ababa, at some point, I got pulled out of class and driven to the Minister of Innovation and Technology, who wanted to personally congratulate me on the course. And then he also said, and by the way, he would like to do a deal with us to... Um, digitalize Addis Ababa utility payments. So the idea is that people can pay buses and public transport, also gas, electricity, water, uh, with a digital currency that my company is supposed to build with them. And of course, the students, former students, uh, helping with that. So um, that was very successful. And Mongolia, of course, the course hasn't happened yet. But um, just mentioning it and that we are willing to do that and offering that already was successful. So last week, uh, our CEO signed an MOU with the Mongolian Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Association and the Mongolian FinTech Association. I've also been talking to the Ministry of Education. And um, so there everybody is quite excited about us having the course there and working with us. So um, there's talk about working on a air pollution uh, sensor system for, for Ulaanbaatar because um, it's a very polluted city. As now it was fine, but in winter, actually, all the nomads come to the city and burn lots of coal, so it's horrible. So all lots of small children with breathing problems. So one idea is to do an IoT thing there and um, put um, air pollution sensor data on the blockchain and uh, we'll probably be involved with that. Another problem in Mongolia is that 66 out of 1,000 people uh, need to use antibiotics, but 18% of those are polluted or, or not pure. So that's another um, potential use case for blockchain to somehow make sure that the, um, the, the supply chain of, of antibiotics, that it's safe. So yes, so even though the course hasn't happened yet, uh, it was a big door opener to, to enter the country and, and start talking with universities and, and the government. So yes, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Hello. Hi. My name is Nathan. I wanted to know whether there is a there's a process which helps you decide which country you would choose next, or can we approach you directly? For example, I would like you to do such a course in India, in association with my company there. Mm -hmm. Would you be open to such ideas, or you just choose your companies on, uh, countries on your own? Um, I mean, we are still growing, growing very fast, so we only started two years ago, so uh, until now it has been a bit ad hoc, but we, um, we try to, to bring more structure into it. So we would definitely be open to the suggestion. I can't promise that we'll actually do it, but it would definitely be interesting to talk to you about doing it in India. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions?
Okay, another round of applause for Dr. Brunias. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to uh, hear um, uh, speakers from uh, Cardano who have very refreshing views to share with us. Refreshing views, which I hope are as refreshing as the break we'll be having now. We have a 15 minute break. Coming up after that, we have uh, speakers from uh, NextABT Waves, the Mota Digital Innovation Authority, and others as well. So make sure you stay around after the break. See you in 15 minutes. <laughs>